Okay, so, oh, I, I didn't realize that you can't play A8. Aix, Rook D2, or Rook B2, and then you just take the pawn on B4. King, oh, King of six, Rook B4, Bishop E7. Only chance. If you go for six, B4, Bishop E7. But then Rook B8, and then Black gives up an exchange, and he's got chances. Why does he have four seconds? How does he oh win? Oh my, he doesn't know what to do. Bishop E7, there are chances. Take, take E7. Oh, take play Rook E7. B1, play Rook B1. If you play Rook B1, oh, you Rook B1 oh. oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That didn't just happen. Oh! Oh my god! I've never seen anything like this in my life. Oh, and he's he is just destroyed emotionally right now. Oh my god! How? What in the world? I didn't even see the mate. Me neither. Rook F2, Rook F2, Bishop coming to D3, Fabi with 15 seconds. When he goes Rook D1, pinning the Queen, Queen D3, pinning the Bishop. Wait, wait, King G2. Oh my goodness. A queen H3. Oh my goodness. His Queen's queen coming H3, in. It's not over. His Queen's oh. coming either to E6 or to H6. How is he doing this? 15 seconds. This is anybody's queen game. Seven. This is a time scramble. Take it. Take the Rook. Oh my goodness. Take, 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 take the, the Rook. Take the Rook. With Bishop B4. Fabi oh saw it immediately after he played it. What's going on? Eight seconds. Seven seconds. Who's gonna win this G4 bidding the queen? Push it up. D6, D6, go! Oh my goodness, D6. Push it. Oh my oh. gosh. Oh my god. The queen! He gave him a queen! He promotes! He promoted! But, but he's, he's no got time. three seconds. He's, he's got, got three pawn. seconds. Take the pawn! Can he get the pawn? He Take does. the pawn! Take it! Take the pawn! <laughs> there he goes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and it's gonna be a draw. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> but still, how did he say that? Fabi's gonna be annoyed with himself that he didn't win that, let me tell you. Oh, Bishop D5 or Queen D3 is hanging. Oh, so. yeah. oh, really dangerous. Six seconds Queen for Kirill. Okay, you got to move, Kirill. A4. Now oh, he wants Queen. Fabi to take so that he can put a Rook on D2. Yes, and that's not two good. Two seconds. Fabi's going to move. He's going to lose a time. He barely has a move of a Rook D2. Rook D2. Rook D2, Rook A4. Bishop D5. Bishop D5 Bishop is D5 the Bishop D5 is huge. Bishop D5. Does he see it? He two seconds. It. One he second. Move. He's going to oh, lose. Oh, my gosh. He lost a time. He just didn't move. Oh, oh my god, my. the position where Fabi resigns after bishop d5, are you kidding me? His feet were stuck in cement and he couldn't budge and he doesn't get a move off. And couldn't. Fabiano Caruana in a lost position. He couldn't he get it. out of the quicksand. Six seconds for David, Black's gotta make moves faster. Rook h2, rook h2, come on. Queen Queen eight. Eight. Oh, oh, Queen A wins the Rook. Queen A oh was winning gosh. the Rook. Black is really slow. So is David. Oh, <laughs> I think David's going to flag him. He's giving the right checks. Oh, Rook 2. Oh, Rook 2. Oh, 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 he missed it. Oh, take the Queen. Oh, he took it. Oh, my goodness. Knight back to F1. Amazing. Oh, my God. You have to. Oh, oh stalemate. stalemate. He should have made a Bishop. He could have flagged him with a Bishop. Oh, my Wait. gosh. Does David and Tone. Oh, David Antone is slightly worse time. He's finished save, still qualified. Wait, no. no he didn't. David no, he didn't. And David Antone qualifies. Oh, <laughs> the stalemate gets him through. This is unreal. Oh, my gosh. He surpasses Fedeseev, poor Vladimir, by less than one tiebreak point. Mm -hmm. Hikaru is the white pieces. Yeah. He knows mm -hmm. his biggest advantage is in time scrambles. Does he make a Berlin draw very quickly to get to the three plus two? Uh, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> I'm, Robert. I, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just throwing it out there. Robert. Yes, Anna. You called it. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. And we have a very quick draw because what Hikaru is saying is you can have the white pieces, Fabiano, but in three minute plus two second increment, I am king. If DC3, there might even be rook takes, rook takes a six. Rook takes a six. Oh my gosh, and bishop e5. And Fabiano's He's thinking, which means that he, it. he knows it's there. He yes. knows it's there. And he finds it and he plays it. Wow. You can play rook d1. You could think about queen takes b, he just takes on b7 Which because the rook and rook d1. Oh my gosh. Checkmate afterwards. It's over. What a game.
He takes on B7 first to cut the king. The black king has nowhere to go. Rook D1 is the winning threat as well as the hanging rook. Plus queen C7. There's just way too much going on. I didn't even think about queen C7. Queen C7 is mate. It's mate in one. Oh my gosh. He has to see mate in one, right? That's game. Game over. Oh my gosh. That is checkmate. That is Fabiano Caruana saying, you sure you want to play me in blitz? I can handle myself. Right. But it was Oh my oh. god, he mouse slipped! Ooh. Oh mouse slip. I think he was trying to play H3. He was trying to play H3, and somehow the rook got to H3 and not the pawn. That happened has happened to me so many times. You click the square and then you click the piece by accident, and it moves to the square. Oh my lands. Could have had three results in this game. We definitely could have had three. <gasps> oh, he pre moved Bishop G. No he pre moved Bishop H5. Just what oh. I was gonna say, it's gonna be in a draw, and then we're gonna have a tiebreaker, but no, David Paravian tricks Nepomniachtchi. Oh my, Fabiano 56. has missed this when he moved Bishop to D1, and now he is desperately trying to find a defense, but there is none. No defense. King comes to. Well, C2, and there it is. We have a champion. Wow. Wow, Lavon, his first time in the finals. And he makes it count, $7,500 richer. <laughs> the little one is a beautiful person to begin with, but I think what his sentiments and what he said was really inspiring. Indeed, and I, th I don't think Lever wants to leave us, so we, we can still talk about the carpet too. I, mean... <laughs> I, I, I actually, I totally and whole, wholeheartedly agree with you, Yasser. Uh... <laughs> You have never said anything nice about me. <laughs> exactly. Uh oh, yeah. uh, and this is. <gasps> no! Oh, oh no! He dropped a rook. Oh, he made a free move. He made a free move. King G3. This is such a weird position. <laughs> He's like defending the, you know, checkmate on F7 with his life. And I think he just lost the piece there. Oh, yep. that's it. No. That's it. That's a full piece. King E4. Oh, he, he should have played King E4, I think. Knight mm. takes, there's knight takes. Oh, oh no. He can't do it. It's check. It's it's time. It's time. It was a time pressure. But, but overall, I was just trying to move quickly and, and build up pressure. I think also because last week when I played Levon in the uh, 10 plus 2 game, I mean, I was much worse. But then when he got to about like 10 seconds, he started making some, some mistakes and inaccuracies. And, and so I definitely had that in the back of my mind in terms of what I was trying to do. We have Wesley playing Grishuk here on board four. Both of them with two out of three. A pretty big game that has... Oh, he wanted the rook! <laughs> what? That must have been a mouse slip. Jostam yeah. is one of the most underrated speedsters you'll meet. And he is incredibly fast. He's, he's not going to lose this game. And he's actually playing for a win now. <laughs> Wesley is just not experienced in these time scrambles. And he's got to be very careful not to lose this. Oh, he lost it! What did I oh just say? Gosh. Oh my god, he has to go, he has to trade rooks into a lost pawn end game. Wait. Wesley should have taken the draw. Now we gotta make sure we keep the knight f5, knight g7, but then you've got the 50 move rule. When is it? it? No, but there's, I feel like you, oh, you have like 20 moves left. So <laughs> exactly. He needs, to be, he needs to be efficient, but he's got made an 11. Made an 11, he say. Whoa. Bravo. Wow. Vladimir, bravo. Well, there's a lot of pawns. It should actually be easy to play for black, right? Because what do you do when you have a yeah, lot of he's pawns? Gonna <laughs> he's gonna get mated. You gotta he's push him, baby. Four. How come what, that pawn what, isn't on a Mate, rook d3. Oh, he saw it. He, found he saw it. the mate. Unbelievable. How does he do it again and again and again? He won 
again. Bishop okay. d7, bishop d7. The engine likes d takes e5 after bishop d, which, which I did personally is a surprise, but Ikaro plays it instantly. Wow. When Ikaro is looking in the air, you know something's coming, and mm -hmm. he doesn't even need to push a5. Look at that. He doesn't even need to push this pawn. It's the threat of it that's keeping White's king at bay, and I think Levon is going to resign right here and right now. Wow. Wow. And he does. What a game. Are you excited to show that the older generation still has some miles left in the tank? Well, you know, it's funny. Actually, wait, as I think about the candidates, am I actually, wait, am I the oldest player in the field? <laughs> I, 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 that, actually, I didn't think that, about it until now. That, way, that dawns on the car roof. It's like, wow. I actually am, right? I never thought about that until now. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. I've never seen mate with two bishops in a knight. No, okay, stalemate! Every move is stalemate. Oh my god. This is actually really hard. Yeah, Not get the knight stalemate. out of the way. The, the knight Rikor, is confusing me. Get, get the knight out of the way. Just go get it to get it to H8. Ah, uh, get the knight oh. out of the way. He just made him no. with the bishops. He's gonna stalemate him. Oh! What's <laughs> <a stalemate>. oh. <laughs> He manages to win. Oh man. Uh, oh, Rasmus, Ari, Ari and Tari. Oh, mate! Whoa. Mate, he missed mate! He missed mate on a6. Oh, but he's going to win by flagging. Okay, he's oh. still going to win, but that was the mate. We had mate on a6. Wait. Oh, oh my god, you're oh. oh. What are you doing? Move. Oh. oh my god. He lost. Yep. Oh, the fat. Rook d4, rook c5, rook a5, rook b4. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you play tickle right there. Oh. <laughs> 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 Except twist ending, he's gonna play the Berlin for a win. I'm just and he's got knight f6. He has got knight f6. I, he's got knight f6 castles. He took e4. <gasps> a sacrifice. He blundered. Is it, will he blunder the bishop? He blundered the bishop. He, he blundered the bishop. Oh, oh my oh, god! Just, but the knight is trapped on the edge. That's an board. amazing idea. Trapped. A novelty of the year. I've never seen this before. Oh my god! Oh, I'm Poussin. How long did you see that? Queenie four check. The queens are dancing. Oh my god. This is amazing. Check, check, check. Oh my god. One of them, one of the queens shuffled their way to peace. Oh my god. The king has to go through b5 to a4 to b3. What is going on? Oh, king b4, king. Draw. Oh my god. <laughs> what the... And Grishuk with the wide eyed, what just happened? Look. What? He's making serious inroads. Dude, and he found that with no time on his clock. Oh Here my god. B3. Why? He mouse slipped. He mouse slipped. No. A mouse slipped to E4. But what did oh he want to do? Oh my gosh. I don't know what he even wanted. Rookie 3 doesn't make any sense either. Oh my lands. It makes no sense. Babby just lost his mind there, but oh, it was already really bad. to play on and we see Fanislav Kovalev uh, taking his time here what is he uh, gonna do okay oh there was Queen H5 maybe possible there's no, what threat, is of really uh, threat of checkmate on the back rank <gasps> threat of checkmate I is checkmate is too <laughs> soon Anna Anna Maya look too at soon look at that indeed Anna and you gotta be careful here to not give a stalemate as in you uh, place your pieces in such way <gasps> No! As I was saying, you said it just happened! Careful. Anna, you jinxed it this time! It wasn't me this time! It was you! We are so good at this! <laughs> we are a great team, Anna! I, I have to admit it! <laughs> over, and once the h7 pawn is gone, it is. Mm. I was trying to say this game over, but it's not! <gasps> Two this is pawns. unbelievable! Rook h7, and if you take on h7, there is king takes. Wait a second, you're not. Oh, no, you're so not you taking take. it. You're you not taking it. Of course and not. You cannot move. You move the rook away, you get the check. The king cannot move. The pawns cannot move. It is an incredible position. The is smiling uh, in pain a little bit, I guess. There's f3. And he wants. Ooh, oh, I see two. Okay. Uh, 91, 91. He bought oh. the one. Wow. Okay. Ah, uh, and there's no way to get on e6. Wait, can you go king h1 and rook d6? 
Bishop move? So, yeah, he gets it back. So, okay, he has to go seven, like Bishop C7. Wait, what? He pulled his Bishop! Oh, look at him. He can't believe it. After that amazing defense, he just hangs his Bishop. And Jan Napomsi takes that Bishop. He takes the game. And thus, this week's Rapid Chess Championship It's still on the side. He got her down to 30 seconds. Oh, no. He might not do that. He might not be able to do it. He's down to 25. Okay. The... Oh, he had to go oh. Bishop B3. He didn't go oh, Bishop no, B3 there. He's escaping again. Although it can only get to A3 because B3. 19. These are under control. These are under control. So you can force so the king. It's fine. King A2. Oh, he should definitely go King A2. King B5. Oh, oh he's B... back to home base. And he needs to get this way. Yeah, yeah. He's going. He's, he's going. Escape. He got her with a draw offer. He didn't do it. Oh, my goodness. Nodibek Abdusatara continues to be the closest thing to Kryptonite that we have seen for Hikaru Nakamura. Hey, over oh, 2 Nice try. Oh, look at the pre moves. Oh, get up to. Wow, that's some great pre moving. Go, 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 go. Go, Serana. Go, <laughs> Flagged! <laughs> I, oh my god, it's a draw! <laughs> you didn't find any other moves to make. Oh, that is ridiculous. And he just like laughing because otherwise he's gonna cry. Menu of options. Oh! What? Wait, what? Rook H. Oh, oh my oh, gosh! What a move! I did it! Oh my god, he's just turned it around! Oh my, what an unexpected move! Oh my god, I completely missed that. I did, that didn't even occur to me in my and, wildest dreams. And it's losing now because you, your queen oh can't move without lands. losing the rook on f7. You have to take the pawn, he's gonna right. fight! Oh my gosh. Queen oh, move. he's gonna fight! Oh my oh, goodness! He fired a whole pawn! Oh! He lagged and he flagged. And there it is, Hikaru Nakamura wins the Sunday knockout. Amin Tabatabai versus a new player haven't seen before, Harsha Barata Cody. Did I say that I've right? Seen that. All right? That was actually Baratatha Cody. That was really good. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have got. I wouldn't have said that. If I was Barat there, you say it. Oh, oh, ah, ah. oh no! Oh no! Queen Bro, of that's two. That's twenty-seven hundred stuff. That's Dude. ridiculous. Queen of that's two because you're going to ninety-three. Uh, no, ninety-three. 90, oh, ninety-one, oh, even better. I'm out. I'm out. Dude. Oh this my is... God! He threatens mate in two oh, ways: man, back rank and G two. Yeah, yo, do we got fair play on Hikaru? Let's get the fair play team. Yeah, well, Gronov has got to be pissed on that. The bishop can't move because G2 would have been mate. And look, he's not even done being dirty. Oh my <laughs> god, this is the like... A little shake and bake, stick and move, right? Triangulation. Dude. Check look at this. two again. <laughs> just, go, just go right back to the same corner and remind White that it's stalemate. Yeah, this is so cool. Whoa! <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! He caught him! He caught him with the brain! It hurts! Oh no! <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> it hurts. Okay, you can do either one here. Wait, what? <gasps> he didn't play rook d8. Oh my god! Eight. He didn't play rook d8. Eight. He should have played rook d8. Oh my gosh! Icaro does it again. What no. in the world just happened? He was one away from resignation. Bordnick could lose this game now with only four seconds. What That's is going crazy, on baby. here? I am I am absolutely blown away. How did we get here? What in the world? You called it, Danny. You said that because Hikaru didn't lose that first match against Bortnik, where he had the losing position multiple times during that match, actually. Uh, he was in trouble, but he saved it. He recovered from it, and he wins it all. Hikaru has that effect on players, and he's a hard guy to put away, and that's why he has won yet another rapid Chess Championship presented by Coinbase. Um, 
So Bortnik though is, oh gosh. Oh, he didn't trade the Queens. Uh, it, was... it was probably <laughs> winning. And now I don't think it is anymore. And Bortnik is just pre-moving every single move. Is Roosevelt <laughs> gonna flag him here? Two seconds for Bortnik. Oh my God, don't flag, don't flag. Oh, it, I mean, at this rate, Bortnik is gonna flag him. Oh, that's oh, a free queen. Oh, queen, oh my God. <laughs> But but the queen but black hung a screen just primo 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 it's gonna yeah. be a draw right <clears throat> okay <Yeah. laughs> simply how chess works okay the king starts coming but of course black can't really make progress here so actually he has a really nice setup where he can just shift back and forth and back and forth forever um, but now Fabian is putting the bishop on d3 maybe to make sure he cannot pre-move anymore um, okay. Okay, now maybe you walk the king around. Yeah, the other oh, thing that's important to note is so you can't move the bishop here. So when the king is on a2, if you move the bishop away, then bishop b1 check, king a1, bishop c2 is going to win. Um, uh, bishop, what if you oh, move the bishop? Oh, that's so good. Oh, king e2, king e2. Oh my god, oh. Fabi got him. What a nice maneuver, yeah. Yeah, the bishop has to move if Fabiano wins the game. That was so clever. So using the king to block the rook. King, a rook h2 here? Yeah, but rook, Take rook h3? What was king h6? Rook h1. Wait, king what king... was king? Was that a mouse slip? I think that had to be a mouse slip. What in the I, world was see... Oh my oh, god! Oh, but h2, h3, h3! h3. How, do you, how do you stop the pawn? He's gonna lose! Rook, f... rook f4, rook g5, rook g5. Yeah, rook g5 and goes to h5. Oh my goodness! Yeah, but... But if you go h2 here, isn't it just a draw? Rook g1, rook g1. Yeah, rook g1 is perfect, and rook g6, I guess. Also, watch out for this one little check. But king, the... f, but king g7. Yeah. It's over. Duel's going to lose. King g7, it's game over. This is shocking. It's insane. h2, rook g1, it's over. King h6. Yeah, he's going to go rook b8. Okay. And rook g1. This. Rook g1, it's over. It's done. Incredible. h1, just h1. How did that happen? The mouse slipped. I guess he mouse slipped because he wanted to go king e5. And... Amazing piece sacrifice by Grisha Kaki. Just e4, you're just crashing through in the center. And take, I mean, take with the rook, free moves over. Oh my goodness. Take or e3, anything should be winning here. e3, I think. Even king e3? takes g7, you know, just <laughs> take this piece is hanging, but either is super I mean, what nice. do you do against Palm and Grishuk? What an amazing win to clinch week 16 of the Rapid Chess. We are joined by the winner of the week 16 KO, Alexander Grishuk. And Alexander, what a day you had. How do you feel after that bullet victory? You seem like you were stressed and then you could finally breathe for the first time in a few hours. Yeah, I'm extremely happy, uh, especially, you know, since pandemic started, I, I was struggling uh, greatly uh, in chess. Okay, I also had a very bad mood for two years. Uh, because of this, uh, everything connected with pandemic, with uh, the masks. Uh, yeah, I'm extremely happy, actually, just extremely. And uh, you know what, that like around one month ago, I said to my wife that basically I have two ambitions left in chess, is to win title Tuesday and this uh, weekend rapid. And basically, if I win it, uh, I can retire with a clear conscience. But uh, you know what? Uh, I won, and now I don't want to retire. Knight f4, there's rook a3 check. Uh oh. Forcing the king back, king g2. Mm -hmm. Another repetition is possible. Oh, oh, four. Give me the pawn. You lost the pawn. And you lose both in a row. Oh, that means a white can't lose. lose. Yeah. And you could just take g3. Done. Oh, f5. Oh. That is. Queen f6. Seal. Queen f6. Wait, queen e4, I guess. There has oh, to be queen mate e8. here. Okay, wait a minute. Maybe queen no. e4. Any... No, no, no. Oh, rook c4. Oh, he's just seeing everything. He really is, and now knight e2, king h2, and Hikaru still Can you, wait, still uh, can you take on g3 in that position? Uh, that's maybe the most clear cut. Oh, you just blast through the entire, the gates on the king's side. Right. I don't Hikaru's... actually see anything. Um, oh, rook, rook d4. d4. Wait, g4, what a move. ah, g4, fg, there's nothing, yeah. And then hg, I play rook takes g4, cause, not king takes g4, because then you take with check, and Hikaru's going to lose. Wow. And a fist bump from Jewel Massard 
betrays a smile, and that was one of the most unbelievable matches we've seen in a long time in the RCC. Okay. Rook H1 bind jewels, and okay, again, he played pretty quickly there, and E2 ends the game straight up. It does, E2, yes. Rook C2. Oh, wait, no, it oh. doesn't, no, it doesn't, no, it doesn't, no, it doesn't. Oh, King E1! Oh, my God, it might lose. Oh, my yeah. God, I blundered. <laughs> but thankfully, thankfully, uh, he doesn't stumble on. Rook H3. Jules still trying. Yeah, he, okay, he should probably, he should play until mate, like you said. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, okay, ah, but he doesn't. Okay, very gracious, it. yeah. It is, it is gracious, yeah. Very gracious by Jules, but Dimitri Andrekin surviving an internet scare and winning in style. He wins yet another weekend of the RCC. What a beast Dimitri Andrekin is. Ooh, F5. I remember Naka once played this F5 against me in like a really bad position. It was like a 960 game and mm -hmm. he's basically like getting mated, but he plays F5. <laughs> like everything is open and then I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> but oh man, Fortnick with the fist pump. <gasps> okay, so Rook D8. Rook D8's the move. Will he find Rook it with D8. four seconds? This knight on C2. No, he is doesn't. C1. Rook C3. Oh no, this is not gonna work for black. Nine on A1 is too nine on C2 is too good. E3 is a nice hope, but there's rook A3. Boy. Uh, throws another check, knight A3. He covers the pawn on a light square. David, it's all over. Yeah. And Bach knows that he's gonna resign. Unbelievable time scramble. Look at Wesley so so relieved. Dang. I mean with 30 seconds, this is nerve-wracking for me, Kostya. I would no, not want to do this with two seconds. This is very hard for White now. I mean, look, White spawns under control. White has to make sure he doesn't allow it. There we go. The King D1 there. King D1 could have been winning on the spot. Yeah. Again. King D1 yeah. again. And he finds it this time. He finds it this time. Dubov is Just upset. Check promote. Just give the check. That's it. Wow, he blew it. He allowed this King D1 multiple times. And that's it. His King is not getting to the G pawn. Black is taking it. And Pravian wins the game. Rookie four own oh, finds what it. Does have do? He doesn't see a move. He's got six seconds. I don't see it either. And he allows me to win. Oh no. Wow. Hikaru, he just finds the trick so, there. Unbelievable. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty well, confident equals the move before equals Bishop D3 was To promote to a knight. And then there might be some way to oh, give up. Oh my gosh. In the last position, promote to a knight. And white plays King H3. Maybe that's what Fedose was trying to he's do. Got Maybe he Bishop up, F1. Uh, he messed up the auto queen. Maybe he's trying to promote. Yeah. And couldn't get control over that. Yeah, you just got to hit alt, guys. Public service announcement. You hit alt, and then he gives you the option. Oh, boy. Wow. Oh, man. This And Naka, I think he can just like shuffle back and forth. Like, I mean, obviously, he's going to find good moves here, but he's he just like, you can just chill. I mean, how long can you play on four seconds? We're about to find out. Let's see Wesley kick into that other gear he had. That other gear he had, he went to meet in his first 50 seconds. Right. Now another pair of knights. No! Oh, my God. oh, he flagged. Oh, no. Wesley. Time situation has equalized. Oh, and now that it's winning apparently. Yeah, knight c4. Uh huh. Or knight d7. Yeah. That was a bad decision by him. He had to go knight d5. Whoa! Rook takes e3. Move, Vidit! Wow. Is he queening that pawn? Oh my god, Vidit's so slow here. Wow. This is crazy. Is oh, king b5. Black wins. Wow, wow. Did you see that? If white had promoted, black would have taken the knight and skewered the queen. Whoa, yeah, yeah, queen. I saw that. Oh, Who's gonna win this game? Vidit, Vidit's gonna flag. Black still is a oh, pawn. Wow. Wow. Whoa. Bobby's going for the win. Wait, but Bobby? he's gonna lose. What is he doing? Well, oh, he what what is he doing? He wants to flag him, but he's gonna get checkmated. What? Wait, no, he's, wait. 
Uh, yeah, Fabi is black, right? Okay, so Fabi's black, so he's oh not doing so well now. But can he hold this position, King B7? He's got to make sure to trade the queens, otherwise he's going to get maided! Oh! He's getting maided. Oh! oh, man. Oh, he seems so upset. Look at him. Oh, my God. Oh, man, I would be upset, too, if I did that. Fabi, I feel for you. I think he might have mouse slipped Bishop G6. I'm not sure. Maybe. Oh, the knight hangs. C6. Oh, so passive now, all the black pieces. Look at this. Total devastation. Bishop F7, though. Knight F6 check. Oh, goodbye. Rookie eight mate. Bang. Beautifully done by Sam Savian. Why is this winning? Oh. Can King he D1? just go through? King He's D1? going around. King D2. Is he in Zugzwang? Bishop E8 and Bishop H5. And he can try to get white in Zugzwang. I don't see it oh. yet. King E3. Oh, and Bishop he takes. Threw? He takes it. Wait, is this winning? Takes, takes, king f2. King. It is winning. Takes in g6. No. Yes. <laughs> yes, e no. I got it. King e2, king yeah. g2, and g4. You give up Whoa. one of your pawns. You fix the other one on g5, and you induce Zugzwang. Zugzwang. Oh, my. Will he play it? He doesn't even need to do it. It's over. Uh. Samuel Sevian is going to win this game. This is un- Believable. Wrong way, Wesley. Should have gone to G6. Four seconds. King G4! Why did he do that? He was in Zugzvang. Oh my god. Oh, why did he take the pawn? Oh my god. Oh, he blundered the knight! He blundered the knight! Oh my. Wesley smiling. Sevian shaking his head. The same coin, but two very different sides of it. Goodness me, this game! It had it all! A unique online event with enticing high stakes, the inaugural season of the Rapid Chess Championship delivered its fair share of big names and big moments. And Hikaru Nakamura is going to win! How did he do that? With more than 50 grandmasters claiming cash prizes over six months of weekly competition, it was also home to a healthy helping of big surprises. E6, wandering up seven! This has been such a roller coaster. Awarding over half a million dollars in cash money. But year one of the RCC is not done yet. The Rapid Chess Championship is presented by Coinbase, and the finals are finally here. The brightest stars from the regular season, including Hikaru Nakamura, Fabiano Caruana, Alexander Grishuk and more are back to take a run at a fresh $150,000 and the very first Rapid Chess Championship title. Also in the mix, the familiar faces of top players known for dominating elite online chess events. How will they handle the pressure of chasing a championship? And crashing this party as wildcard invites, some of the most famous names in competitive chess drop in to stake their claim to the $30,000 first prize. My friends, it's the inaugural Rapid Chess Championship final. Who will make history as our first RCC champion? What surprises are still to come? We are soon to find out. Welcome to Championship Sunday here at the Rapid Chess Championship presented by Coinbase. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess alongside me today, as always, Grandmaster Daniel Naraditsky. Danya, we're at our final four players. Jan Napomshi has a leg up on the competition. He can lose two matches on route to a championship here at the Rapid Cham Chess Championship, but three players, Wesley So, Dimitri Andrekin, Hikaru Nakamura, they're looking to unseat Jan Napomshi and win the crown. And let me repeat that, in order to win the RCC, one of those three players is going to have to beat Jan Napomnishi twice. And beat Jan Napomnishi and twice, they don't go very well together. So they've got their work cut out for them. Jan has been on an absolute tear, and I am so excited to see whether Jan will continue his absolute dominance over online and over the board chess today.
He has been phenomenal indeed. Let's remind everyone of the format here and the finals. We started with 16 players, 12 from the Rapid Chess Championship Series. Those Grand Prix points were accumulated and 12 players made the field from that. Four other players, including Yanda Pomshi, were invited directly into the field. It's a double elimination bracket. The matches are two games of 10 minute plus two second increment. And if it's tied one to one, we get the beloved Armageddon format with bidding. We had a lot of fun with that yesterday. Fun for some players more than others, but still, we like that. And the prize fund, Danya, it's massive. And we only have four spots remaining. So the players know that at a minimum, they're getting $13,000. Yeah. And they are, of course, looking at that $30,000 prize. They have taken out their car loans and they <laughs> have gathered together the down payments. This is an incredibly generous prize. But uh, the bigger prize, and we all know this, is the fact that the winner uh of the rapid chess championship is it has a certain ring to it let's put it that way yeah rcc champ i like the sound of that and i think every player remaining in the field whether it's dimitri andraken wesley so hikari nakamura yana pamshi they're vying for that crown first and foremost but the thirty thousand dollars not a bad payday indeed and it wouldn't be possible without our presenting sponsor and no better person to give them a shout out coinbase than our chief chief chess officer danny wrench the Rapid Chess Championship is brought to you by Coinbase. Whether you're looking to make your first crypto purchase or you're an experienced trader, Coinbase has you covered. You can earn crypto by learning about crypto at Coinbase.com. Explore DeFi and Web3 with your Coinbase wallet. Get exclusive rewards when you spend with your Coinbase card and much, much more. Learn more at Coinbase.com slash chess and get $10 in Bitcoin when you sign up and verify your account. Check them out. Use the command sponsor or command Coinbase today and go to Coinbase.com to get that Bitcoin, baby. These are our, our four remaining contestants, Danya. And let's start with Wesley So. We see him all the way in the left-hand side of the screen. And as is usually the case in online chess, it seems like the only player who could take him down is Ikaru Nakamura. Yeah, and we saw that yesterday, Wesley deconstructing Dingley Ren, and he is just a force to be reckoned with. He proves once again that he is among the most consistent players online. We, see, we saw that week in and week out in the regular season of the RCC. We are seeing that uh, once again here, but Ikaru Nakamura, he is Wesley So's kryptonite, and he is everybody's kryptonite. So Wesley, I mean, he can hold a set up high. He certainly can. He is a matching with Dimitri Andraken, who, as we discussed yesterday, time and time again, the guy is overlooked, and yet here he is as one of the final four players in the Rapid Chess Championship. Yeah, we were talking about it at length yesterday. Dimitri is over 2,700 feet. He's not some run-of-the-mill grandmaster who happens to be good at Rapid. He is someone with a tremendous over-the-board pedigree, phenomenal opening repertoire, great positional skill, and nobody likes playing him. I've never come across a person who excitedly said, I am playing Grandmaster Vichy and Draken today. It's going to be an easy game. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not the case. And Hikaru Nakamura, whether he plays Wesley or Andraken, he knows he's in for a tough battle. Andraken has won many, many title Tuesday events. Wesley So has won the Grand Chess Tour, among many other top-level events, including the U.S. Chess Championship numerous times. So Yanda Pamshi, at the end of the day, he'll await the winner of the loser's bracket. Not every day, Danya, where we use the words loser's bracket and Hikaru Nakamura, though. Yeah. I mentioned that Yana Pamishi beat twice, don't mix very well. Uh, Hikaru Nakamura and Loser's Bracket don't mix uh, very well either. We certainly do not. But as we've been talking about Dimitri, let's bring him up for a hired player resume. We've had him on screen a number of times. That's because he's outlasting much of the competition. He is a two-time Russian champion. And Danya, if people know anything about the chess world, winning the Russian championship once and then twice, come on, that is a superstar. Yeah, that's an absolute impossible task. You have to surmount uh, an unbelievable amount of super GMs. Andraken's pedigree precedes him. His second place finish in the RCC regular season uh, was somewhat overshadowed by Hikaru's absolute mastery. But let us not forget how consistent and how masterful he is just day in and day out. He is superb, and this is his player resume. But 
Time to give a shout out to our great partners in Hired. If you're tired of cover letters, applications, and hidden salary ranges in tech, Hired empowers software engineers to manage their own hiring path with a marketplace of over 10,000 employers worldwide. Hired's candidates, experience managers will help you navigate incoming employer interview requests, giving you back the control to land a tech job you'll love. What's not to love? Create your free Hired profile today. Well, Danya, we have just one minute remaining until the action kicks off. It is Wesley So, it is Dimitri Andrekin. And I think a talking point that we actually have forgotten to mention is Andrekin did superbly in the uh, Grand Prix, in the FIDE Grand Prix, where he scored, I believe, 10 points in the first Grand Prix that he didn't play in the final stage where he would have been the same group as Levan Aronian and Hikaru Nakamura. That's how Hikaru made his way to candidates. Andrekin, he was right up there with the best of them. So uh, his online chess success also translates over the board but today it's all about this rapid time control and right now it's about beating Wesley So. Yeah it's one of those matchups where you have an immovable object against an unstoppable force both of these players are incredibly solid we we did see Wesley very uncharacteristically lose the threat of the game against Ikaru Nakamura with the white pieces and he's got to make sure that that doesn't happen again but when Wesley gets his type of position He's an absolute buzzsaw. And it's we know that. It's a great way of describing him because he just will rip your uh, uh, position to shreds. I mean, the way Wesley so wins game is like, I don't really know sometimes where his opponents go wrong, but Dimitri Andrekin plays in the same vein. He is the type of player who, yes, like he did to Fabiano Caruana in their first game, he'll just tear your position apart tactically if you give him the opportunity. But he's, mu he's much more of an end game aficionado where he'll outlast you a pawn up, grind you down, and score that full point. Yeah, I think of their playing styles as kind of a uh, one of those spiky cogs that keeps turning and turning. When you throw something at it, it just completely, you know, it, it disassembles you. And by the time you're done with Wester So, you have not a single connected pawn chain left in your position. Your king is wide open. You're down material. And both of these players are exactly like that. So when they face off against each other, we always get very exciting games. And Andrekin, you know, he's looking pretty calm right now. Wesley So, he has been very demonstrative after his match victories, right? His hands are in the air, fist pumping. <laughs> yeah. So it means a lot right. to him. Yeah, it has been. And now the game is underway. We see that move knight f3 played by Andrekin, d5, the standard choice by Wesley So. So I guess as we get into this match, before we see any results, we do need to ask a question to the chat because we want you to get involved. So with the game starting, Coinbase wants to hear from you. Who will be our first rapid chess champion? You have four people to choose from. Make Robert your choice. Robert Hess is not one of them? No, no, no. He is gladly off the list. Mm. <laughs> That's a real shame. I don't want 0% of the vote, you know? <laughs> In the meantime, we have a pretty interesting opening. Dimitri Andrekin going off the beaten path of this move, C2, C3. Now, C4, Robert, leads to a very topical line of the Grunfeld. C3 is a move that was previously championed by Vladimir Kramnik. It is often followed, oddly enough, by queenside expansion with A4. There it is. <laughs> and you just get a position. Yeah. And, I mean, when we look at this and Andrekin with the white pieces, he probably doesn't want to test... Wesley in prep like long lines of preparation. He wants to just get a position, but he's comfortable with, and this is exactly one of those. Look, look at this position. You can put a5 for white, you can play knight e5. You have options here, so it's not like you have to stick to just a single plan, but knight e5 does seem to be a principled approach with a5 to follow. Yeah, putting putting together some early queenside pressure. Uh, I don't really see a downside to, to starting with a move a5. I mean, knight e5 seems a little bit more committal. Uh, but starting with a5 looks perfectly perfectly reasonable. Now, one thing to decide for black is where to put the light squared bishop because the hyper fianchetto, bishop c8 to a6, actually makes more sense to me here uh, than the more conventional uh, development uh, to b7, Robert. Do you, are you on the same page about this? Yeah, yeah, it's a more open diagonal. Bishop b7, you like to say this, Danya, bad bishops defend good pawns, and it's protecting that great pawn on d5. But bishop a6, it shuts down the a file. It doesn't allow white to thrust that pawn forward to a6 himself, and that was Wesley So's choice. Good call, Danya. <laughs> Just as I was making the move, he played it. 
<laughs> just grab that bishop right from your hand. Uh, right. So rude. Honestly, <laughs> Wesley is, I mean, like, very consistent with his overall pattern of behavior. <laughs> um, yeah, not uh, one of the most humble people on the face no, of the no, earth. No, 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 definitely no. not. Constantly bragging about his achievements, how well he did in the RCC, <laughs> even tweeting about it constantly. Uh, but in oh. any case, so, so Andrekin now has to decide where to put these two pieces. Now, Bishop F4 is the standard uh, development of the bishop in such positions, as far as I know. Yes. You and, could, could well, I was going to quickly say, Dunnan, that a lot of players would take on B6 immediately because they want to open up the rook on A1. But that tension is not going anywhere. In fact, the tension favors white because look at the rook on A8. It stares into its own pawn, whereas white's rook has much more space on this file for the moment. So why give black access to that same line? Yeah, white is the one who knocks on the A file. And black is not about to go B6, B5 and create a gaping hole on C5. No. No, no, no. And that bishop on a6 that we were just praising would be terrible all of a sudden with a pawn directly in front of it. So uh, c5 is a much more likely play from Wesley's perspective. And mm -hmm. I don't easily see a plan for Dimitri. Okay, knight b to d2. It feels like not the London system exactly, but just like in the London system, sometimes you put all your pieces on perfect squares. And then the question becomes, what now? So, Daniel, what are you seeing from Dimitri's perspective? What does he like about his position? Well, he likes the fact that he has more space on the queen side. He likes the fact that Wesley is, you know, somewhat cramped and tied down on the queen side, and Dimitri controls some of the dark squares, uh, particularly if Wesley plays the move c5. But this is a very familiar situation to me, where I, I, you realize that, that this moment will occur about two or three moments before it actually does. You're like, I, I still have a couple developing moves left, but very soon I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to have no idea what to do. And... I am, much like you, worried that after Wesley plays c5, Dimitri will reach that moment when you've made all the developing moves, you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. What do you have to show for it? I mean, you can't win a game with a space advantage. Maybe no. he won. Are you going to go e4? Is that your I'm plan? thinking about flirting with it. I guess you also allow your queen to move. So rookie one is sort of dual purpose. You may push that pawn, but at the very least, you protect the pawn e2, and that way your queen can go out to a square like a4, and maybe there are places to infiltrate from there. Another idea that I have, Danya, is maybe, I don't know if it works. Can I throw, throw in a bishop d6 first and then play knight e5, or am I actually going to get my bishop trapped? Well, yeah, you're basically, you know, telling your minor pieces to go handle themselves. <laughs> you know, whatever happens, happens. You're on your own now. <laughs> yeah, just deal with the consequences. It's not my responsibility. But anymore. it's not easy to access that bishop on d6 because if the knight on d7 moves away, then the c5 pawn hangs. Right. So it's definitely an interesting idea. Okay, well, rookie eight takes the sting out of bishop b6, so now that mm -hmm. would be a pretty nonsense move. So, all right, <laughs> Dun Dunnan, we've reached everything that we could have possibly asked for. Is it time for e4? Are there other moves to make, like... A queen move. You can play h3 or even h4 if you feel like <laughs> yeah, just pushing. Yeah, you can bombs. always play h3. You know? <laughs> There's always that, and then Wesley will play h6, and then maybe g4, and then maybe g5. g5 <laughs> <What do you>... <laughs> right. <laughs> just, Bishop g3, yeah. king h8. <laughs> just little moves here and there. And when in doubt, start playing on the king side. Ninety-five. Uh -huh. There we finally see it. The knight jumps forward, and well, black. I guess doesn't want to take on e5, not because of d takes e, but bishop takes e5 feels a little bit annoying over there. So can I make a different move for what about knight h5 here for black? Yeah, knight h5 looks pretty pesky, actually. Wait a moment. Knight h5. What is white going to do? Because if white plays knight takes d7, says no problem, I'm just gonna move my bishop back. No, no, no. Black's going to take on f4 first, right? And this is not a positive transformation of the structure for white. Black is better here. The bishop pair, the healthier pawn structure, right. and thereby the safer king, if you want to look at it that way. The knight on d2, not in the game. So I think Dimitri overlooked knight h5. And yeah. Danya, from an early stage, you're saying, oh, white is comfortable, safe. But look at Dimitri's clock, by the way. He has never found a plan in this game. He's making logical moves, but without an actual overarching plan. And now Wesley, well ahead in the clock, and I think his position is better. Yeah, Dimitri has to find a way to twist himself out of this position. There is this weird idea of going bishop g5, 
uh, you can do that immediately. You can do that here. And after queen takes g5, knight takes d7, you're attacking oh. b6. But Wesley can just drop the queen back to d8, force the knight back to e5, and say, hey, I've got the two bishops. I'm happy. Yeah, although at least the pawn structure isn't compromised from Dimitri's perspective. But of course, Wesley is better in this position. So Dimitri, look at it. He just actually, he raises eyebrows like, oops, didn't see this one coming. This is just as great of a position as you could possibly ask for from Wesley So's perspective. And it's a good sign if you're a Wesley fan. Yeah, and this is just what he does. He never beats himself. He He's so consistent. He plays healthy moves. And he just makes you look like, not like a fool, that's the wrong word, but when you're playing Wesley, you know, you just don't feel good about your position, no matter what position you have. Did you see, by the way, that Wesley pre-moved A takes B6? Yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> badass move right there. Yeah, it's like, not only is he just one of the best chess players in the world, given each player hours, he's saying, I actually know how to play bullet chess with the best of them, and he does, and he pre-moved A takes B6 to put Dimitri right back on the he, clock. He, he crushed me in a blitz match yesterday. He was incredible. Well, he, he beat me. He was incredibly <laughs> fast. Yeah. And he pre-moves. He knows how to time scramble. He doesn't have any obvious Achilles heels as no. a blitz player. No, he doesn't. I mean, he really has that style that, uh, as you're saying, you don't want to play Dimitri on Draken. You also don't really want to play Wesley So. And right now, I think Dimitri is the less happy of the two. And Wesley's up four minutes on the clock. Yeah, we're talking. We're shooting the breeze. In the meantime, Dimitri's under four minutes. I've been thinking about Queen A4 here, but that is obviously not a move you make if you're enthralled to their position. No. I'm just trying to find some way to resolve the tension in the center. Yeah, queen a4 is a way to do that, but I think black will still take the bishop on f4 and then deal with uh, the knights aiming at each other after that. So, Yeah, I guess you can just take. No, yeah, that's, it, that's not serious. Well, knight d7 is played, and now knight takes f4 seems automatic. Or is there a difference now that the pawns have been traded? No, I don't think so. No, I think you take. Because knight takes b6, there's always knight takes e2 check. Right. So Dimitri's going to play e3. You know what's funny about positions like this, Danya? I always feel like, okay, black has to be better. And then I look at this bishop on g7, and I look at all of white's pawns on dark squares, and I'm like, do I really have the advantage when my bishop is blockaded by these pawns? And so the answer, the solution might be to play cd4 at some point and bishop f8 to improve uh, the scope of your bishop. That's actually a great positional idea. And would you consider doing it immediately? Just right here and right now, C takes D4. I'm a little nervous to release the tension. We've been talking about that a lot throughout the days of commentary here. And so uh, Wesley says, no, let me let me keep that alive. And does this give Dimitri an opportunity in any way? That's what in knight F3, knight E5, you're putting a queen A4 as well. Yeah, queen A4 could be a little bit annoying for black because it limits the scope of this bishop. You don't want to go bishop d3. You don't want to give away the two rooks for the queen. No, definitely not. Especially because white will have total domination over the only open file. Right. And actually, if you put bishop b7, queen b5 seems right. really annoying to me. And there's all sorts of tactical shenanigans that might uh, negatively impact black's chances here. For example, if we extend that line after queen c6, white can take and drop a knight on c4. Oh, and before you know it, you're under a lot of pressure. Your pawn on b6 is a full-fledged weakness. No, oh, that's actually a frustrating line. And once you see it, you realize that a queen trade may sound good, but it's not getting you much. So b5 good move. is Wesley's choice. It, it is definitely a good move, but one major drawback of this is if Dimitri can play knight b3, his knight might land on c5, and then you regret the fact that your pawn is no longer on b6. For sure. So Wesley will have to follow this up very accurately in this position maybe c4 but c4 could be met by b4 if dimitri really wants to close things up <laughs> it's weird to have queen your queen is, on queen a5 is almost strapped there but, <laughs> yeah. it's but it very can evacuate strange. to a2 if necessary right. and the bishop can't go to b7 which would trap the queen if the pawn on b5 was defended so that's the big problem for black is the bishop stuck there and i think with that head shake there and now with some time consumption Wesley not thrilled. I think he believed he would have a bigger or more clear advantage, but Dimitri, he is just a frustrating player. He's just annoying. 
I mean, he just knows how to get under your skin in any position. Right, and the knight might get under black skin of knight b3 to c5. Yeah. So knight b3, what does Wesley have under his sleeve? Uh, he better okay. show us real quick, because I'm actually starting to get worried about his position. Yeah, once the knight hits c5, you might lose this pawn. And if you lose this pawn, then the position starts to crumble. Wait a minute, c4. No, knight. you don't have bishop b7 after knight c5. There's a cool line. After c4, knight c5, bishop b7, it's a totally moot point because white can just play knight takes b7. For sure. And the queen on d6 Backing is under the queen. attack. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there is something long-term we should talk about. If we look at white's pawn structure, all of mm -hmm. these pawns are in dark squares. So if c4 and later b4, things like that, even with opposite color bishops, it could still be dangerous for white because these pawns can be attacked by uh, black's bishop. Black's pawns, on the other hand, the pawn chain is as strong as its base pawn. Good luck getting to the pawn on f7. I mean, that's untouchable. Right. That's a great point. But, I mean, Wesley's dreaming of such an endgame right now. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's a little bit far away from it. So c takes d4 seems to me more, more logistically doable than c4 right though cd cd of course we're not going to take with the e pawn to make our f4 pawn uh, loose so uh, what's your no again before knight c5 jeez you know what might be the best thing to do is play cd4 cd4 and just bishop b7 give up your b5 pawn mm -hmm. and just try to get activity because the bishop on a6 is a truly terrible piece and it's also making your other pieces worse because you're tied down to its defense i also think he does have a way to bail out this line i mentioned to you earlier c5 uh, c4 and bishop b7 i abandoned hope quickly but i actually think this might be the most prudent option if we bring up the analysis board your queen takes b5 bishop c6 i think traps oh. the queen believe it or not I and white it. can but the most important thing is white cannot get two rooks for the queen because the bishop defends a8. Now, I pointed out that white is knight takes b7. He absolutely does. But you, your point, I think, is very well taken here. Black is most certainly not worse. If I had to choose a side, I would actually probably take black, despite the fact that white holds ownership over the a-file. Right. And that, that's, this is the exact type of position I was foreshadowing. So thanks for bringing it uh, to the board here for us. And C4 I is Wesley's, Wesley's going to bring it to the board. Okay. And after knight C5, do you have any other choice besides playing bishop B7? Because your bishop's just under attack over there on A6. I guess rook A7 is a move, but... Ooh. I, but then knight A6 and B5 falls, so... Right. But at least black controls the A file. You're right. You're, you're not ever saying, at least I have this <laughs> after right. dropping a bomb. I something to hang my hat on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's super clever. Knight a6 is met by rook b6 now. Typical Wesley idea. Right. Oh. He says, I want your rook a7 to team up on the knight a6, but this is a better way of doing so because b5 remains protected. So if Dimitri doesn't take up, what is Wesley's next move? Is it going to be... Bishop e7? Maybe or something. Bishop e7 thing? or b4, possibly? I say with no degree of confidence. Oh, my b4. goodness. Oh, God. We are in for a barn <laughs> burner here. <laughs> Dimitri so, just added a load of Tabasco to yeah. this position. He just wants to open this position up because look at that rook on a8, and there's a bishop on g2 that's been waiting in the shadows, ready to pounce at the right moment. After d e four, bishop takes e four. I guess bishop b seven is still possible down here. Oh my god, I was not expecting to do this kind of calculation <laughs> at this at this hour. Bishop b four, bishop b seven, knight b seven, and then just take the queen on a five. And then there's a fizzle out, and the pawn on f four is a huge liability in that resulting end game. And once black takes it, the bishop has a direct pathway to c one. Yeah, this seems like Wesley somehow got the best of all worlds here. The end game we were uh, highlighting as possible, and now it's even with a worse pawn charge. So Dimitri thinking, which means he might take on e4 with the knight, but then I think Wesley can get his, uh, his, his claws out and steal f4, and then what does Dimitri have to show for it? I think Dimitri largely played e4 on an intuitive basis. I don't think that he calculated it too deeply. 
and now bishop b7 very nasty move and dimitri will just have to try to make a draw in that opposite colored bishop end game okay so knight takes b7 looks forced to my eyes it is so what's dimitri thinking about i guess i mean there's no other move here that's a good question every second is golden this end game is not going to be easy to defend here's the mass trade oh and the rook a8 yeah, that's what I was about to ask you. Is Rook A just forced to draw? Because Not if it to does, ask you that. Just, just go for it, right? I think it does. I think it does. I think it does. Rook A8, if we very quickly play through the moves, takes, 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 Bishop C6, and you eat up these two pawns just in time. You're going to be down a pawn in the resulting position, but I'm pretty sure White can hold that. Dimitri, though, choosing a different approach and probably an even more accurate one, going for active defense. But d5. Yes. So kind of a similar idea that he ultimately wants to start trading pawns. So even if he loses the f4 pawn, as long as the queen side comes off completely, it's just a uh, complete and utter draw. When you're, you're right. down a pawn, opposite colored bishops, pawns on the same side of the board, uh, the side with the extra material is not going to win. So he's going for rook a8, or he could put his rook on a7 if the bishop lands on d5, and that way f7 is a target. So I think that Dimitri has this handled quite nicely. Yeah, I wouldn't say that this is a three-result game, but, you know, if Wesley does something untoward, you could end up dropping a bunch of pawns here in the blink of an eye. Right. So, like, for example, rook f8, I believe, is a mistake because then yeah. rook b7 happens and you drop b5, which protects b2, and then c4 is likely to fall next, and that's how you lose games like this. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You you lose them by playing a reactive move. You know, oh, F7's hanging, let's defend it. That, that's not how these endgames work. You need to strategically choose which pawns to give away. I think Wesley's going to go Bishop C1, something to that effect. This is just a draw. Yeah, Rook F7. by Dimitri, by the way. No, Kept that was composure. perfectly executed there. And also good composure by Wesley because it seemed like he overlooked this like Queen A5, Knight B3 type of maneuver. But instead of freaking out and uh, causing himself some unnecessary issues, he's just like, you know what? I have the black pieces. Let's just make sure that everything remains solid, that I uh, can make a draw at the least. And here we see every pawn is about to be traded. If the rooks are swapped, B2 falls first. But after Bishop A6, B5 and C4 will fall right next. Yeah, it's so interesting. Black actually takes both of White's pawns first, but then White instantly takes both of Black's pawns. Yes, and, and we often offers forthcoming. We often see this in opposite colored bishop endings. And well, what's was Wesley really thinking, or is he just trying to gather his bearings to you know figure out what he's gonna do with the white pieces? Well, he's either taking yeah, exactly. He's taking the bonus time uh, to 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 think about the opening in the next game. Maybe he's reviewing this game in his head which you sometimes see players do. They're looking at their score sheets, trying to identify where the improvements were, but he takes on C3, accompanies it with a draw offer, which is dutifully accepted. You okay. know, the final position, Danya, and the result, that does not tell you the full story of that game. I, I would thought Dimitri Andrekin had a shaky position early on with a knight h5 move hit him by surprise and then he played pretty much perfectly after that he just got that activity with his e4 push he traded the pieces as was necessary so uh, I would say that Wesley should be the happier of the two but Dimitri he can count on his chess skills because he showed some class there he certainly did and his form has improved just exponentially Ever since that nightmare first day, remember, he blundered two pieces in succession. And now here he is putting together flawless defensive effort against Wesley So, But he needs to bring his A-plus game with the black pieces. And I'm very curious to know what opening he will choose. Will he play a Sicilian or will he stick to something more solid? I think the problem with what you said, not your words, but what they indicate is that you said defensive effort. When you have the white pieces... You don't want to be on the defensive. You don't. <laughs> and especially not against a top player who, oh, Dimitri's. Tell you what. Wait, do you see his doesn't want to be on the defense of the black pieces. But do you see I his one do. bar of connection right now? Dimitri was the beneficiary of some uh, untimely disconnection from Five and a Caruana yesterday. But right now it's his internet that needs to be stabilized. Yeah, hopefully everything turns out decently. I mean, Wesley has also experienced some issues. So we hope that that will not be the decisive factor in this game. G early G3. 
even before knight c3. That is strange to me because can't black just play d5 now? <laughs> I mean, I think so. <laughs> right? Like, you normally. That's include... what my mama taught me that you <laughs> stop. Stop D5. That's why you play knight C3, you know? <laughs> right. Like, I, I have not seen this particular position before, but Wesley, who did spend 12 seconds on that move, either he's bluffing and he's just playing a random line, or he has something up his sleeve. Kind of reminds me of that Fedeseev Bishop E3 move in the second <laughs> yeah. charge. I don't really believe it, but Andreykin did. Yeah, but now Wesley got the exact position he wanted. Not that this is bad for Andraken, but it felt like Andraken could have punished Wesley's move order by striking in the center. For sure. And h5 is a very fashionable move in, in this variation, and as well as everywhere else, by the way. Yes. And, and I think that a lot of players, they react immediately. You play h5, I have to play h4. I cannot let you push that pawn and open up your rook on h8. But look at Wesley. Look at so. Wesley, yeah. He says, come at me, bro. Like, what are you doing? You have no pieces over there. So you're spending all this time just to get a fake attack. And I'm just going to continue developing. Maybe I play knight c3 here. Maybe I go rook e1. But there is no actual attack for black. Not until black gets let's say, a queen to the h file, and that's much easier said than done. And one very typical idea here, you mentioned the move rookie one, is to stick a knight on d5 eventually. And if black continues to neglect his development, it, it's going to be a question of when uh, rather than whether the sacrifice occurs. Yes, and then you have to weather a storm because the, the attack <laughs> is coming in full force. So uh, for black, it's a question of how to develop your pieces. You can't play a move like b5 right now. You're not developed. So the bishop on f8, not really seeing where that goes. So maybe knight g8 should get out of there first, and maybe it's knight g to e7. That's actually a common idea. He instead closes in his bishop, a classical approach here in Sicilian. But Donya, Six, it's like yeah. he wants his cake and he wants to eat it too. I because, literally was about to say that phrase. Yeah, like he's he wants the classical Sicilian, but then he's also played h5, h4. I, I literally was about <laughs> to use that exact phrase. I was going to say once... He wants h5, h4, and he wants the Sicilian, and he wants development. Something's got to give, mm -hmm. right? Something's got to give. And what's giving is the fact that he's lacking in development. Now, can Wesley exploit that? So generally, the machinery that you put in motion is rookie one and knight d5. That's what I was taught. You could also take on c6 and play e5, but that works a lot better when there's a knight on f6. If white does that here, black simply plays d5 and Black is very happy to close the center. Actually, I think you can just put that on the board just so we can just show knight mm -hmm. takes c6, pawn takes e5. If there were a knight on f6, then Black would have to react to this dual threat. But without the knight there, as you're saying, you can just play d5 and close the position down. And look at what Wesley has done. So he does capture and plays knight a4, which is a good idea because you want to play c2 to c4, and you're gaining space to the queen's and don't discount e5, even if it doesn't attack a knight on f6. Sometimes you actually want your opponent's pawn to go to d5 so you can take over all the dark squares on the queen side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, this is responding to Andraken's sort of weirdly classical kind of ambivalent approach with just a centrally based, positionally minded idea. Knight a4 and c4. Petrosian would be proud of that. The old yes. Soviet masters would be proud of of this treatment of the position by Wesley. Oh, he's playing perfectly because now there's no D5, all of White's pawns and pieces staring at that square. And here, Bishop G5 is available. G5. You might actually force Black to take on G3. And no, Wesley says, brute force is my plan of action. I'm just trying to ruin your pawn structure. Yes, yeah, sticking a needle right in the heart of Black's center. And Dimitri, Bishop C8 to G4. I mean, this does not look like standard Sicilian development. <laughs> look at this position. I mean, the fact that the bar is at zeros, or even actually says slightly better for black. black. Okay, I'm going to ignore that for the moment. This looks terrible for black, right? The one thing that Dimitri has going for him is that this pawn is on h4, which means that at some point, if Wesley is not careful, h takes g3, Bishop h3, now we can see how the attack rages on. But I don't really believe in the attack. I think that strategically, Black's in big trouble. So if he cannot solve his problems tactically, then he is not going to have fun. And I have a far more mundane concern, 
which is that Black's King cannot stay in the center forever. Eventually, and this might actually happen on the next move, the center is going to open up. So I think Andraken's top priority here should be to find a haven for his king, whether it's on F8 or on G8. But I might be more concerned about Black's King than White's King. Right. And what's fascinating is H takes G3 was somehow a, a mistake. You see the eval bar immediately go up uh, quite like a H3 bit. H3 might have been the move. But, I mean, that, like, if you think about it, like, if we just can show this, H3, Bishop H1, it's like, what did you really gain? You have no attack anymore, zero. And now your pawn structure is getting ruined. You're going to have the C6 pawn that's going to be targeted. Like, doesn't that just feel counterintuitive to play H3 here? That's a sunk cost, right? You've sunk three tempi into those pawn moves, and... What do you have to show for it? A dried up king side. You're absolutely right. It is very hard to go for that. But now I think Black's position is genuinely miserable. Right. Because can't you just take on d6? Not like you want to take with a queen on d6, but otherwise the c6 pawn drops with check. But maybe that's the best thing that Dimitri can do here is like take on d6 with the bishop and after the check, just move his king and say, I have this attack that I'm putting in air quotes. No, there's no way he's taking with the queen. No way. No way Dimitri's going for that. So bishop d6, queen c6 check. Is the king just going up to e7? I believe it is. And I don't think Wesley's going to take on c6. I think Wesley's going to make a developing move, such as bishop e3, and say, hey, you know, I can essentially take this pawn at my leisure. Go defend it. Go waste another tempo playing rook b8 to c8. Uh, and what you said is such good coaching advice, honestly, that so many players, they say, ooh, yummy, free pawn, with check, let me grab that. But you're spending time with your queen again. You're not uh, finishing your development. So, well, on the other hand, Dimitri takes with the queen just to defend that pawn. But I think I Bishop, e, but Bishop E3, now, it's like White's ideas that you were just talking about are even more obvious because Black is not developed. And, okay, so the queen is obviously stuck in the middle of an intersection and it can move to the side it can move to e6 but wesley could then even consider pushing his f button and i know that sounds crazy because your king is on g1 but you have a bishop on e3 you have a defensive cocoon around your king your mind of pieces can handle it your pawns can be repurposed as attackers rather than as uh defenders of the king Right. The That's best definitely giving Dimitri pause right now. Oh, for sure. And the best way to avoid getting checkmated is by checkmating your opponent first. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I completely get you. And I think that strategically, and I'm, I don't even think I'm uh, stating something that's crazy here. I think strategically, Black is lost, right? Like if the status quo continues here, Dimitri's just going to lose this game because he's got split pawns on the queen side that Wesley can easily target. And he hasn't finished the development and his king is in the center. So everything possible is kind of going wrong for Andraken right now. Bishop e7, though, that's probably the lesser evil because his priority is still to castle. I think once he does that, it's going to be a little bit easier for him to uh, to reapportion his resources and try to defend his queen side. But, I mean, you can see the eval bar. It's not, it's not lying. I think plus two is a pretty accurate assessment of this position right now. And if you think about castling here for black, which he might have to do at some point, we'll see six yeah, good job. Castling. But, but the, the thing about this is you played h5, h4, and then you castle. So you have given up on your attack and you gave white all these tempi because Wesley ignored all that stuff. That shows the plan was not properly executed. Such an instructive moment when Wesley castled, honestly, on move seven. So few people would have done that. And, and look, look how it's paid off. He's got these three extra tempi on him. Now, queen takes c6. Is it grab time? Mm, I'm worried about bishop d7 at the grab end of some time. of those lines. And yeah, that's why, of course, Wesley, you, you can always count on Wesley to make these improving moves b3. Now you don't have to worry about your b2 pawn. Your knight on a4 is defended and many of these mm -hmm. variations where you do take on c6. Now, Wesley is just playing this game marvelously. Yeah, it's, it's been absolutely exquisite. b3. He's enjoying his life. He's up three minutes on the clock. Dimitri Andraken is in mortal danger here. And I'm trying to think of a way that Dimitri can even survive. You could put your rook on CA just to defend this pawn, but it looks such a miserable defense here. Uh, Bishop C5 at any moment just to uh, trade queens, and rook D8 instead is giving up this pawn. 
Yeah, I remember that meat grinder. That cog is starting to spin. And Black's position is starting to come apart at the seams. But I see why he's doing this. Can we just show queen c6, a queen swap, and bishop d7 again? You cannot take a6 because of bishop b5 hitting both rooks. Ooh. That's definitely a sleek tactical detail. You also can't drop back to c4 in order mm -hmm. to defend your right for the same exact reason. So the challenge for Wesley is indeed to choose the right moment to take on c6. You don't want to overstay your welcome, but you don't want to grab too early either. So maybe rook fe1? Not sure. I like your, your idea before of pushing the f bomb, but let's move it one square rather than two. Play f3, then rook f to d1, then maybe bishop f1 to go after the a6 pawn. We can just target that queen side. White's king is never going to be attacked. Yeah. No, it's you can you know, basically disassemble your defensive fort here and repurpose the pieces. Uh, the bishop on g2 did a great job as a defender, but now it can function primarily as an attacker of the a6 pawn. And uh, Wesley, he's taking his time here, which is the smart thing to do because he's really calculating. Queen takes c6. Maybe I don't win the second pawn a6, but it still could be worth it to grab that pawn. Or am I giving Dimitri unnecessary counterplay? And top-level GMs, I think you could back me up on this, Danya. They would prefer to be down a pawn with the activity than have even material and then be always. suffering for squares. And that's always true. That's true of any Grandmaster worth their salt. Yeah. And so that's why Wesley's taking his time here. I like F3. I, I didn't actually realize that White can get the rook to D1. That's sort of the ideal scenario. Yeah, you have one rook barely down a pawn, the other rook taking care of the open file. And the rook on B8 has a semi-open line, but that's why B3 was such a good move, because it's a protected pawn. The rook is just staring at nothing in particular. So I like F3 here. And Wesley. Well, I think he had Ben Feingold over for dinner yesterday. So, <laughs> you know, he's, he's not so sure that Ben, Ben might still be in the house. <laughs> and Ben's in the background. They're, don't worry, everybody. Fair play checks. We know that the uh, coast is clear there, but Ben has made it sure that Wesley will not be playing that move F3 or F6 anytime soon. Yeah, and he has sunk three plus minutes on to, into this move. And now it's a blitz game. And yeah. knight a4 to c5. Ooh, okay. I don't know about that. Yeah, what's the... So I don't understand at first why the bar went down so much. I mean, he takes away the d3 square uh, from any trades. He did close the c file, you're right, but he is attacking a6 now. You can't go rook a8 because knight b7 fork. Oh, gosh, bishop c8. Bishop c8, yeah. I mean, I, he's vacating the g4 square for the knight, though. I think True. that might be a bonus, a little nice bonus of the move bishop c8. So rook fd1 first, just to uh, force that queen back to c7. Ugh. Exactly. <laughs> and that's not, not like... much more needs to be said. Ooh. What? Okay. It goes back to a4? Sometimes we... Knight g4? Yeah, sometimes we praise top-level players for understanding they made a mistake and retreating their piece back to where it came from. This was just odd. What? And now rook fd1. No, Knight Black does not need to move his queen. Knight takes e3 and queen h6? What did, what just happened? What? Queen h6? Oh my god, Wesley's gonna get himself checkmated. What is he doing? It, okay, so he's not made it because he's the f1 square. Right, but oh Jesus. Yeah, now Dimitri, look, you could see him. Look at his posture, right? Before he was Wait. like back and. Oh! There's a of shenanigans. a5 and bishop a6. Oh my gosh, a5 look is a this. sick move. Bishop takes c7, black wins, queen h2 check, king f1, bishop a6 check. The king is brought out into the open and executed by the queen. Oh, my gosh. So and Dimitri's going to find this move, too. You just know it. I'm just shocked that Wesley gave not just free tempi, right? It's not just, like, small little moves. But in they played a5. He gave his opponent ideas. The knight went to g4, the queen to h6. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my lands. And this look, is... at, look at Dimitri. He, he's giving him the shush finger. He's going... Full on Dikembe Mutombo, the finger yeah, wag is about to happen. Get out of here. I can't believe it. I mean, what is this turnaround? What <laughs> is this turnaround? Wesley somehow doesn't look phased, but I, you could, oh, there it is. There's the head shake. Finally, you know, his, uh, 
his emotions are finally out there. Like, what did I just okay, do? But, but he needs to, I mean, he's not losing and he needs to keep himself composed, calm himself down and find the move Queen E2, which actually might be the only move. And he just did. Yeah. That... And he just did. You know, Queen E2 is a move to close the diagonal. You often don't want to put your queen in front of the face of the king because you're thinking about a pin, but the rook's on B8, not on A8. And that's a very important distinction because there is no bishop A6. And with the rook staring each other down the D file, maybe there's going to be enough trades to happen that the white king is going to feel a little bit safer as the game continues here. Two other important details. If black takes on C5, white's knight recaptures in general and covers the A6 square. The second detail is that if black manages to engineer the move bishop a6, white can intercept it with a rook from c4. So if you play rook a8 here, then I actually think white can take on e7 right. and then cover bishop a6 with rook c4 and potentially get two pieces for the rook. Really important point there. And so if you think, Don, you just told me bishop a6 was the winning idea, things have changed here. And I think that now Dimitri, he is a tough decision. Does he keep the rooks on the board? Does he keep the dark square bishops on the board with a move like bishop g5? Uh, not easy for him. So the eval bar, it's not misleading anybody, but the position is very complex. And Dimitri sinking most of his remaining time into this critical moment. This is, you know, he couldn't have dreamed of getting a queen to h6 and a knight on g4 like this five moves ago. And all of a sudden he has this, but how does he capitalize? He doesn't know. I certainly don't know. I don't uh, know. Bishop but, G5, maybe just like a neutral move? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. He could also play a move like Rook E8, but I'm a little scared giving up the back rank. So he does play Bishop G5, and Ooh. I would just swap quickly and play Rook D1, and now it's a fight once more. It's easy to forget that that Rook is actually D8. Yeah, you make some other move, but no. He random move, move. not Wesley So, and the Bishop is going to probably move back to G5. Looks like a reasonable square to go to and okay so what's what's his plan of infiltrating there's a rook d6 type of move i don't know if it's knight actually d6. helpful knight b6 as well is there i'm starting to get worried about this diagonal right the queen and the rook on e2 and d1 like if i can just somehow move my knight and then get a bishop g4 but it's too slow always yeah it's hard to actually engineer that so for Wesley, and, and he doesn't really have any infiltration squares either. The bishop, of course, covering d8. Black still has um, <laughs> in the cards the idea of rook a8, bishop a6. That didn't go anywhere. That's still there. It's funny. It seems so slow, but it might be hard to stop. And not to mention, Donna, there's a very common motif of queen h2, and then bishop jumps knight to h3. Uh, you, of course, you need to move your knight out of the way after that. But if that bishop gets to h3, white is dead. Yeah, white is toast, though, because bishop takes h3, queen h1 is mate. So Wesley proactively moves his king away to f1. Mm -hmm. Now, importantly, if knight h2 check and bishop g4, then Wesley can, you know, despite Ben Feingold's presence, <laughs> I think Wesley will play f3 in that case. Yeah. I, I love after eight seconds and one bar of connection, by the way, for Dima. Do you think king e1 is about to happen here? Because if king g1, knight g4, we might just see a draw. But if the, king goes well to, if the king goes to e1, I mean, that's Wesley saying, I'm going to try to beat you because you are down under a minute. Yeah, but then Dimitri can still go back to g4, and he will be threatening queen h2, but no, oh. Dimitri goes for the win. Okay, hopefully his internet, he's back to four bars here. Yep, very good. And his threat, this sounds funny because knight f6 isn't threatening <laughs> anything directly, but knight f6 followed by bishop h3 is up to crush white's king. I mean, it's what's called a second-order threat. I mean, they're a little bit slower, but they're just as serious. And Wesley doesn't have anything to latch onto on, no. on the queen side. And knight b6, okay, bishop b6. What right. now? And then knight of 6, bishop h3 is the exact plan. So it goes rook d6. Okay. So what's his plan after knight f6? That's the million-dollar oh, question. He so Wesley always has moved f3 when bishop h3 is about to happen? Oh, because he's bishop g1. And that's huge. That's huge. Holy, and then there's like Bishop E3 anyway. Oh, gosh. Oh, my God. That's an incredible pattern. We might actually see that. That would be crazy, and that would just be so, winning for Black. But if, if Wesley goes F3 here, then he drops the G3 pawn, let alone. Knight H5. And the fact yeah. that Knight H5 is totally devastating. 
I mean, Holy smoke. it says zeros, but I don't believe it. I think Wesley probably has like one move that survives and everything else might just lose. Exactly. And he's down to 45 seconds. This has been a stunning turnaround. He plays there up is. three. No, 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 no. Knight H5. Knight H5. Knight H5. H5. Sign the score sheets. Knight F F6 to H5. Chiseling at the G3 pawn. Devastating. Bishop F2. Bishop H3 ends the game immediately. Oh, because that's beautiful. Because you're after Bishop takes Bishop on H3. Queen H1 check. You don't even take the Bishop back because you want that Knight fork on G3. You might just see that. Uh, or Wesley, look at him. He's a... Uh, Pretty distraught right now. He had the best position you could possibly ask for. Oh, here it comes. Bishop H3. Bishop H3 ends the game. And Dimitri with 30 seconds to find it. And he doesn't need any of that time. Oh, this he is... saw that a mile away. Donnie, if you showed me that position earlier and said out of 100 games, how many times does Wesley so lose? I would say one. And this just happens to be that one. It's Dimitri on Draken's day. Incredible. I cannot believe we just witnessed that. It's only move 31. 10 moves ago, like you said, I wouldn't have possibly believed you that this position would occur in the same game. And Wesley lets his time run out. Dimitri Andraken with the black pieces from a miserable position somehow turns the tables in the span of five moves. And what does he do? He takes a drink from his mug. You know that's that a sign. Means. You know that's a sign of a happy man. And Daniel, I think we just show Bishop takes H3. We can point out yes. why Wesley let his time elapse. His queen H1 check. You don't even take the bishop back because the bishop has to block and knight G3 wins that queen with a fork. So, I mean, Daniel, let's just go back in time to the moment where Wesley maneuvered his knight and went back because he let the game just escape him in, in a very odd way, a very un Wesley so like fashion. There will be plenty of time for postmortems, but what I'll say is what I think happened is Wesley played knight c5, and after bishop c8, he didn't fully register the fact that the g4 square had been vacated. And he said, ah, let me go back. Dimitri's probably going to defend this pawn. But the moment knight g4 happens, the situation turns completely. Maybe Wesley overlooked. The knight takes e3 attacks, attacks the queen. We won't know until afterward. But whatever the reason is, a very uncharacteristic meltdown by Wesley So, And all credit to Dimitri Andraken. He is just a hawk in terms of his ability to spot these chances. His talons were out. He grabbed the opportunity and he ran away with it, or flew away with it, I should say. But either way, once you beat Wesley So, you should be happy. But then you realize up next is the matchup against Hikaru Nakamura. So the loser's bracket final is set. It is Hikaru Nakamura. It is Dimitri Andraken. And we shall be right back after this short break here at the Rapid Chess Championship Finals presented by Coinbase.
Use gifts from the biggest chess stars on all of your favorite platforms. Just search chess.com and your favorite chess star on Discord, Twitter, WhatsApp, and more to find hundreds of gifts from chess.com's biggest broadcasts and events. Hikaru, Magnus, Botez, Hess, and even me, Danny. Try it today. Coming up is the Women's Speed Chess Championship semifinal matchup between Ho Yifan and Valentina Gunina. The winner of this match will take on Katarina Lockno in the final. You will not want to miss it. It's Monday, tomorrow, 5 a.m. Pacific time, right here on chess.com. And while we're here in the Rapid Chess Championship presented by Coinbase, we do want to thank Hired. Uh, they have been a great partner to have. So, uh, you know, please, hey, software engineers out there, if you're tired of getting random calls and texts with bad job matches, Hired connects you to over 10,000 employers worldwide through one easy dashboard. No cover letters or applications, just upfront salary data and dedicated candidate experience managers to support your incoming offers. Take control of your career with Hired. And we have a question for you. It's on Hired, what percentage of interview requests in San Diego were for remote roles? We asked you that question yesterday. I don't know if the new day has given you any more insight into that. Maybe you Googled it, so you kind of cheated. But our answer is, Donna, do you know what it is? Um, we're for remote roles. Well, remote roles are totally in vogue. Am I allowed to guess? You can guess. Okay, I'm going to guess 48%. Okay, and I'm going to guess, I'll go with 53%. So let's see what our answer is. If our producers can bring that up. Uh, oh, please. Come on. 6%? Oh. Damn, girl. Well, <laughs> two-thirds of roles were for remote opportunities, or interview requests, I should say. But, wow, thank you for that information. I guess the world is getting more digital, getting more remote yes. opportunities is a good thing. It allows more people to apply well, for Robert, jobs. Well, <laughs> Robert, speaking of San Diego, I remember when there was a tournament in San Diego, Yoko <laughs> Harderson played in it. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to play me remotely from Iceland. But <laughs> remember, he had the most interestingly shaped remote control for his television. Right, give it a party. <laughs> oh, Danya, Danya, Danya. Well, we do have our two players set here in the final of the loser's bracket. We have Dimitri Andrekin. Many people were predicting Wesley So to move on and get a rematch against Ikaru, but that was not meant to be. We have the first finisher, the top finisher, the number one seed of the RCC Grand Prix Series. That is Ikaru Nakamura. He takes on the second finisher. That was Dimitri Andrekin. And they're down here in the loser's bracket because Jan Nepomneshi is a man on a mission. He refuses to lose. He beat Hikaru in Armageddon yesterday. But Hikaru, he looks fresh today, Dunja. He looks ready to go. Yeah, and it, it, it's not he didn't get crushed yesterday. It was a very, very close match. Jan was in incredible form. And I don't think Hikaru is going to be feeling... Uh, I don't think that, that that yesterday's match in any way impacted Hikaru's confidence. He has a good score against Dima in the RCC regular season, but you pointed this out yesterday. Dimitri has beaten Hikaru on more than one occasion in the regular season. And on Draken, he has been an absolute buzzsaw today and yesterday and every day for his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. One could say he's feeling it. And these two, they were supposed to square off in the third leg of the FIDE Grand Prix Series. Uh, Dimitri Andrekin had to uh, withdraw from that event. So it was unfortunate we couldn't see these two go out in classical chess. But here we go. It's rapid chess. It is Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces. And it's a vintage Nakamura opening. Yeah, he's got knight f3. He's got the queenside fianchetto. And we are very likely to see a pawn appear on d4 sometime soon. 
but maybe not immediately. The first, first think is taken by Hikaru, but here we go. D4 and a quick trade by Dimitri. He still and seems to be within familiar waters. It's the type of position that someone with that Russian schooling, like Dimitri Andregan, he's like, okay, isolated pawn. I can do with that. But so many players hate having this pawn on D5 with no friend in the adjacent file because it can be targeted as the game continues. But in return for an isolated pawn, you get open files, the E file, the C file. Let's see how Dimitri handles this. Yeah, if anybody in the chat is interested in sort of trends, uh, recently, I think the top engines are almost always claim that that uh, the side with the isolated queen pawn is fine, even if it is blockaded by a knight that sits in front of it. I mean, this is supposedly the ideal setup, but in this particular instance, Black's king side activity is going to counterbalance uh, the weakness of the pawn and the knight blockade. Case in point, queen d6 is coming. That's going to induce serious and permanent weaknesses of white's king side. Yeah, Dimitri did not just blunder a pawn on c6. If you capture twice on c6, you lose the game as white because of queen d6 threatening checkmate, threatening the bishop on c6. So Hikaru, instead, he just develops his knight to d2. And, oh, look at the eval bar. It's saying black. You were saying the top engines, they actually like this for the IQP yep. side. And it's showing that after a simple move like knight d2, which looks pretty normal, all of a sudden black maybe uh, is the side to be preferred. But apparently that was not the correct method although can you possibly blame dimitri uh, no. for playing the move queen d8 to d6 after bishop c7 i also don't really put too much stock into the engines at this point right. because they're going to go up and down but there are no game ending moves at the moment so it's really about yeah. who has the better plan so after g3 i'm sticking my bishop on h3 you don't have to ask me twice to start poking and prodding on those light squares uh, then the follow-up might include rook c8, rook f to e8, things like that. But it's still a position without clearly defined plans just yet. And you don't have to ask Dimitri Andraken twice. He puts the bishop on h3. You're absolutely right. It, the position is somewhat amorphous. You know, both sides have made uh, made the obvious moves. Now they have to show uh, some sort of uh, consistent plan, some sort of idea. Black's idea probably will revolve around exploiting the weak squares on White's king side. That's a lot easier said than done. Right. And Bishop F1 is trying to help those light squares because when you have a pawn on G3, there should be a fiend Keto bishop around there. The bishop comes back home. And Danya, one of the big things is the tension between the knights. White doesn't really want to take on C6 to fix Black's pawn structure, if you will. Uh, but then what is the plan? The knight blockades the isolated pawn, but also blockades your access to the open D file. Right. No, I think bishop f1 is an excellent move. Discharging the tension, tossing the ball right back into Dimitri's court. And watch out for knight f5. If that light square bishop is ever to leave the board, the knight would have access to the f5 square, which is why Dimitri says, no, no, I no, mean, I'll play bishop g4. <laughs> you can come back to h3. That's not totally out of the question. I think it's just a good move. If I'm Dimitri, I'm not trading light square bishops. No, 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 not 100% no. That's a, that's a major concession because you mentioned knight f5. You, the bishop is the only device that can actually fully exploit the light squares. Right. And, and the car is definitely not repeating. No, but what does he do here? Maybe a3 just to play b4 and get rid of this really frustrating pin to that rook down on e1. So that comes to mind, okay. but... I don't want to take on c6, right? I don't want to allow bc6. Maybe it's all right, but it just feels like it goes against the spirit of the position. Right. Ooh. There's knight c6, bc6, and knight c4, though. Oh. Well, in that case, maybe I do want to play knight takes c6. <laughs> because if black, if you can guarantee the black recaptures the queen, but even that might not be the most appetizing option. Because well, the floodgates kind of, I don't know, d4, knight e4 becomes kind of a possibility. But maybe, maybe can we, it is. Can we analyze this very quickly? Because yeah, knight c6. Pawn takes, is that what you're saying, right? Knight c4, knight takes a5, yeah. and then bishop takes f6 at the end. Yeah, no, this is terrible. No, I, I meant black has to take with the queen. Ah, okay, okay. And yeah. this, I'm not sure how to evaluate, is what I'm saying. Got it. Okay, because I was like, B, you want to play bc6, you definitely no, that's can. bc is just losing. So and what is... It, Dimitri's Dimitri's thinking, thinking. It's a bad sign. Is he thinking of bishop takes d2 potentially? But that also looks wrong because after bishop takes d2, 
you can just take back with a queen on d2, and now you have the bishop pair as white. Yeah, don't tell me he's going to blunder knight c4. There's no way. No, he and he does. Six. And rook c1. And okay, where does the queen go now? Just over to e6, probably. Six. Yep, but then maybe the time is ripe for white to play a3 because if white can go b4, stick the other knight on f3, just start getting the sense that black's initiative begins to unravel. And if it unravels, then positionally, you know, we know which side has the upper hand. It's white. Right, though now black can challenge for the c file. And the good news for Andraken is the queen is on d1, so these rooks are not connected. So you can swap on c1, you can put your next rook on c8, and maybe black is first to that fully open line. The other interesting thing is that after b4, bishop b6, white has to be very careful about bishop takes e3 related ideas. If white plays knight f3, the knight can jump into g4. You could even have a queen sack on e3. So white is not immune from kingside shenanigans not even a little bit in fact uh, just to move bishop b6 at any moment is going to be scary for white to deal with so rook f to e8 was played and b4 you may want to get rid of the pin but you're walking that bishop onto a diagonal it probably wants to be on but i don't know if there's an alternative in hikar it's mission critical for white to be able to move this knight out of d2 eventually can you go back to his Bishop F1 ideas and <laughs> hope Bishop that G4 again? Yeah, <laughs> hope dance. that we can make a draw. Let's dance. Bishop F1, Bishop G4, Bishop E2. But am I wrong, Danya, to start thinking for Hikaru that maybe not bail out entirely, but maybe I should start being on my toes a bit because I am looking at these Bishop B6 knight jumps from F6 into E4 or G4, and it does worry me. Yeah, so in the line b4, bishop b6, knight f3. I, I'm pretty sure that this is what Hikaru is investing his time in. You're absolutely right. Black plays knight e4, and knight takes f2 is a completely devastating threat. That just leads to checkmate. Even if white plays knight d4, black can still play knight takes f2 because that attacks white's queen. Yeah, so he... I agree with you. Hikaru has to be careful here. He needs to tread very cautiously because these tactics are not to be trifled with. And the plan is just so much easier to see from Black's perspective. So, uh, you know, in return for having one weak pawn on d5 that later in the game would be a target, for now it's clear that Black has the upper hand because the tactics are in his favor. And with that in mind, Bishop f1 starts making more and more sense. Now, after Bishop f1, does Black really have... No, nah, Dimitri will go Bishop g4. There's no need for Black to seek any unnecessary adventures i mean a draw with black in the first game is a great result for dimitri should bishop f1 occur right i mean the bishop on b2 is such a fantastic piece so we got to give credit to that one uh so if you try to play on from black side unnaturally you may just be playing into hikaru's hand so i think that if we see bishop f1 bishop g4 this kind of repetition is likely and hikaru i believe he's thinking about it. no chess player really wants to just make a draw by repetition in a position like this, but if he's thinking about his overall chances, I think he's in worse shape if he tries to do something to play for a win. He should just look at the position, be objective. He's a top player in the world. He doesn't need my advice. But I do think that sometimes we get into the mindset of, I have the white pieces, let me play for more. And Hikaru is playing for more. B4 is on the board. And he follows it up with Bishop E2 to F3. So what he wants is to maneuver the knight through B3 and assign the bishop the task of standing sentinel over some of these key squares. But we know that that knight on f6 is going to land on e4, and right now? There it goes. In but, three, two, one. Then after knight e4, there's bishop d4. So I kind of like what Hikaru has done here. He found a clever way of organizing his pieces and the pawn on d5 remains blockaded. And if Dimitri can't launch like a serious attack, well, then Hikaru will have the long-term chances. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that Hikaru is just in time because the move knight e4, it actually threatens knight takes f2. So bishop d4 is played in the nick of time, neutralizing uh, what is perhaps black's most important piece, the engine of the attack. But no, Hikaru goes knight d4. I wasn't expecting that. I was fully expecting bishop d4. So where do we put the queen, Danya? Can we put it on f6? I understand that that... Oh. Rook c2 instantly. Okay. Defending the bishop, setting up 
the threat actually of knight c6. This is such a complex position right now. Like knight g5. I really like knight g5 because you freeze the knight on d4, and he's setting it up at some point. But the light squares are about to be very vulnerable. Yeah, knight g5 is almost always dangerous in these types of positions. With the queen also potentially making contact with the rook, that does not. That is not reassuring for white either. What a tense position. Bishop h5 by Hikaru, forcing the queen away again. Okay, so queen... <laughs> queen f6, bishop f3. <laughs> well, queen f6, there's knight moves, right? If, if black goes queen h6, the queen would have gone from e6 to f6 to g6 to <laughs> in succession. And it was on d6 earlier and c6. Oh my god, that's hilarious. <laughs> I think queen g5 makes sense, right? Because queen f6 runs into tactics on the diagonal, so queen g5 is what to me. What? F4! What? I never would have Whoa. even considered that move. What a committal, risky move by Hikaru. Oh my gosh. I don't know about that one. Demetrius says, hey, thank you very much for the E4 square. Thank you for weakening your pawn on E3 permanently. But this is what I was worried about from Hikaru's perspective. It's like, he's clearly playing for a win, but when you do so, there's risk, and he's you know, his king is looking a bit breezy. But Black's entire position is also looking a little bit breezy. Like, if... if okay, but knight f6... I was going to point out that g4 is on the table in certain positions, but definitely not here. Queen d3. I feel like I just don't have a good sense of this position at all. Like, I don't Me neither. know where the pieces should go. Uh, where, the, Why they're going, where they're going. Like, what is yeah. exactly the idea of the move? So Maybe a dragon should double on the e-file. It's like a like rookie. Rookie, rookie seven. For lack of a better idea. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, actually. Like what else are you going to do? And I think of the rookie seven, maybe white should play for like a4, a5. Ah. Just to get rid of this bishop and try, try to make inroads on the queen side because the king side is not looking very good. Uh, so I would try to do something like that. Yeah, and you, you need to hurry up to distract your opponent. Although, actually, rookie seven might walk into g4 in that last position. Okay, but he played queen g6. I would say essentially forcing a queen trade. I, I don't see Hikaru refusing this trade. No. And I actually think it's a very good practical decision by Dimitri because now the e3 pawn is still tender and you don't really have much to worry about at the moment. King f2, all right. Maybe doubling now looks equally as appealing and the a4 idea is still very much on the table and he plays it. And now I'm starting to get worried for Dimitri because yes. uh, knight b3, bishop d4, these kind of moves will show why the isolated pawn is not very strong and Hikaru can just operate right around it. Yeah, you just start getting the sense that that queen trade, Dimitri may have underestimated the queen side pressure, the impact of white's dominance over the key d4 square. And so is a5 a serious threat that black needs to deal with? Because then you push your a pawn, but do you push it two squares or one? That's the big question Dimitri's trying to figure out. It is. And that has a clear downside as well. If you play a6 and white plays a5 and sort of buries your bishop on a7, your bishop doesn't really have any other prospects. But the bishop on c7 isn't all peaches and cherries either. Ugh. No, you and definitely don't want situation. Bishop. The time situation is getting a little bit concerning for Dimitri as well. We hadn't talked about that yet. Wasn't a problem, but he's down to three minutes. And the complexity of the endgame is showing no signs of abating. It's very interesting because Hikaru has historically been seen as this like, great tactician, which he is. But people sometimes underestimate just how strong he is in these queenless middle games and endgame. We saw him beat Jan Napomashi in a night endgame yesterday. That was fantastic showing by him. And now here in this game where it looked like, if anything, he might be with a slight disadvantage, he's suddenly pressing, and he's pressing on the clock as well. Dimitri decides to grab the bishop pair. Hikaru does not give him an opportunity to take on d4 and get into an opposite called bishop position. No, this is trouble for Black. This is big, big trouble. Although after Bishop F5, Rook D2, can't Black take over the C file now? Rook C8. I think that's exactly what Dimitri has to do. 
He has one chance to do that. And that time is right now. Although Bishop exactly. D4 still will be the response. So it's not like Hikaru has a tough choice there. But then the Rook can get to C4. Ooh. Goes A6 instead. So he has different priorities here. Now Hikaru cannot go Rook C1, of course. So maybe this makes sense. He, he, okay, A5. Oh, this is starting to look back. starting to look really bad for Andrekin. Hikaru is just outplaying him. I look mean, at, it's, it really is as simple as that. Look at White's pawns, all on dark squares. Look okay, at Black's bishop on F5, light square piece. So if these dark square bishops get traded, Dimitri is going to be struggling to make a half point. Yeah, the bishop's going to have absolutely no job. I mean, actually, both bishops are terrible here. And now Hikaru has the opportunity to grab control of the C file it, if he wants to. He can also play bishop c5, knight c4, and keep chiseling his way into black's position, maneuvering his pieces onto better and better squares, harassing black's pieces, and attacking the d5 pawn. Okay, it's definitely time for rook c8, in my opinion. Give up their great decision-making by Andraken, where yep. you give up your weak pawn, and we talk about this every single game. You'd rather be down a pawn with activity than be just clinging on to that one little piece there and suffering passively. And Yana Pondish is one of the absolute best players at demonstrating that. Good decision-making there for Andraken. And Hikaru has made a ton of progress in the last 10 moves or so. But what exactly does he have to show for it? Dimitri is still very, very solid as long as he can keep the D5 pawn safely protected. And he's doing a good job of that so far. Yeah, I think now it's going to play F6. F6 there he goes, yeah. King F7. And if you're not looking out for it, that Rook on C8 may land on H8. And with a G5 pawn push for black, maybe there's some, some things to look at. Oh, you can't take D5 because Bishop takes D1, takes on B3 after that. That's Hawkeye tactical vision by Dimitri. Immediately dropping the bishop back to F5. But now the rook on B2 for the time being is kept at bay by this bishop. It can't move to C2. Oh, this is... I mean, the way Dimitri has handled these last bunch of moves... I mean, what's... Hikaru's doing the shuffling. Now I think Dimitri can play G5. Yeah, Rook H8, G5, things like that. And watch out, because Hikaru may be better by the pawn structure, but by activity, here comes Dimitri Andrekin. Well, these bishops have been so patiently lying dormant, they haven't had anything to do. They are itching at the opportunity to emerge from their cages and just land in White's King's lap. And not in this. a good way. No, no, no. Bishop E4 now is possible because uh, you can't attack oh. that bishop. And if you take on G5, the F file opens up, not just the H file as a potential avenue for black, but the king will go to G6, the rook will come to the F7 square, and then watch out for the white king. But Dimitri is taking a hefty amount of time here. He's deciding how to defend D5. He plays the most natural move, Bishop E4. Mm -hmm. And Hikaru, he's done a whole lot of shuffling and doesn't have a lot to show for it, as you're saying. Yeah, and the reason why the bishop couldn't go back to g4 just there was that uh, the d7 rook would be hanging with check, so the similar variations wouldn't have worked out. And then you'd also would have lost the bishop on d1. Right, so king g1. Okay. All right. That makes uh, sense to me. Over yeah, for sure. the h2 pawn. The problem for Hikaru is like, there's no way that I see he's making progress. Like, it's not easy to find an, oh, a swap on f4. Is but maybe he doesn't need to make progress because he keeps milking Dimitri's clock down. No, that's that's very true. Look at Dimitri go, G5. G5. The good thing about double pawns is once you put one pawn on the square, you can also get the next one there. And the more the position clarifies, the faster Dimitri will have a chance to play. So he chooses the best moment to play G5. Now Bishop D4 by Hikaru, paving the way for the knight to take a turn on C5. So Rook C4 strikes me as an interesting option here to go after the queenside pawns. He goes rook e7. Watch out for this f file, though. I was just saying how yeah. black could use the f file. Now the king went to g1, rook f1, rook f6. And he plays it. Yeah, king g. This I'm... is looking quite scary, to be honest. King g8, maybe. Yeah, I think you maybe. have to. I mean, it's the safest square by far. If you go to e6, you might very well get checkmated. Ooh, he goes to g6, oh, inviting rook f6. Steal. Knight c5 instead, oh, which apparently was a mistake for some reason. I don't know why. Bishop f5, rook df2 forces the bishop away. 
Wow. I mean, Dimitri is playing with fire right now. Is he trying to short team on this with King? King <laughs> but then he could get checkmated on F two. Yeah, no, that's that would be my concern. And Ooh. I think I think Dimitri could play Bishop D six just to try to get that knight out of there. Oh my god, he is trying to short team on this. And will he car infiltrate? And if so, where F seven or F eight? This is. And who does a trade of rooks favor? Well, I mean, you're not playing knight takes e four because a rook takes e four. That's no, seems no. Bad for white. So. What in the huh. world? Such a weird position. It's hard for either side to find a move here. I'm thinking rook f7. Yeah, he plays that. So I like bishop d6 because you protect your rook and try to get opposite colored bishops. Fantastic move. And you're aiming at b4. Right. Immobile, uh, taking the sting out of the move, knight takes b7. Okay, well now you can, I think, play bishop takes c5 and make an immediate draw if you wanted. But maybe Dimitri wants more. I don't know how he gets more. Are you sure bishop takes c5 is an immediate draw after like bishop takes c5? Then d4. Oh, and you have plenty of activity for that draw. I agree. And yeah, I think I, you should do that. He's got 29 seconds. Whoa, bishop takes c5 is a big threat. It's a huge threat. It wins the game on the spot. Hikaru might have to evacuate the rook from f7 for that reason. Oh my gosh, Dimitri. This guy, when his back's against rook the wall, he, he just plays better. To pin his own rook, noticing that the concrete idea of bishop takes c5 justifies it. Nerves of steel. The opposite end. could also play rook g7 if he wants to. But make still, it. bishop takes c5, then b takes c5. You're right. That would be a, a draw. But the opposite oh, end the of a pin is a discovery, right? And that's what Dimitri has shown uh, promise in. Black would actually have the upper hand there with, with the king position. He kind of drops his bishop back on, onto a defended square. 20 seconds for Dimitri. Okay, what's he going to do? Bishop g6, rook g7. Oh, he's got to calculate this. He's got 10 seconds. He's got to move. He's got to make a move. I think bishop g6 might be the move, and then bishop f5. Okay, I just, and then, oh, gosh, he goes oh. bishop d6. He offers a trade, because does he want some kind of d4 at the end? No, he doesn't. There's a trade. Oh, I didn't even see that pawn was hanging. Wow. I think he simply wants to build a fortress, and on account of his peace activity, I think he's fully justified to think that this position is drawn. Yeah, his king is king so G active. But king g2 and h3? That's what's going to happen. Bishop e5, king f5 back. Karun knows how to squeeze these types of positions out. We've he seen him does. do it so many times. I feel like, well, bishop c3 is a threat, so that's why he goes back. And now d4? Can you just push this pawn? Who's playing for a win here? I'm not sure. <laughs> Six seconds. Also, white's pawns are oh on my God, Dimitri's sitting ducks. Move! Yeah, Dimitri's bars of connection are going oh, down. He lagged. He actually lagged. Yeah, he needs to stabilize that internet real quick. Like right yesterday. He needs to have over 10 seconds in case of further lag. Okay. Dimitri, gotta go. Dimitri, gotta go. Move, Dimitri, move, 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 move. No, no move. Oh. oh, he's lagging. And oh, his clock is on four seconds. I'm afraid he's going to lose on time. No. Okay, he got it. He got it off. It's just so nerve-wracking. Now, king e3 blunders a bishop to bishop f4, check. Oh, my goodness. You think it's like bishop takes e5. How no. easy is that to make? King e4. And he plays oh. king e4. Bishop takes c5. win this. No, this is... This is... Oh, great move by Dimitri. And that was probably bishop the only move. That was the only move, bishop c6, check. And Hikaru can try... No, h4 doesn't work. Just take, take, take it, bishop take. f1. Whoa, king f6 first? Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. This is, I don't know. I have no words for this defense. And Hikaru down under 15 seconds himself. He takes h3 and bishop f1, and this is a draw. Yes, this for sure is draw because the pawn on g4 wow. is cemented on a light square, which also is on the c8 diagonal. And now you close your eyes, you bring the bishop back to d7, you anchor it to the g4 pawn, and white can no longer make progress. Dimitri scared us there. One last attempt by Hikaru. But by the way, the A pawn, the A8 square, the dark square bishop do not match just in case something, you know, some bad vein Horrible. Happened. Yeah, exactly. No, this is over. This is a draw, and Hikaru offers one. And so does Dimitri. Whew. What a slugfest. Oh, my God. Gosh, I mean, that game, it never really hovered uh, around. It was like minus, around minus one at some point when the queens were on the board, then plus one maximum for Hikaru. But that means it was a very balanced game.
I mean, this was just... The players just put every ounce of energy on the line in every critical moment. And when they got into the endgame, I'll be honest with you, Robert, I thought Ikaro... You just got the sense that he started out playing Dimitri. There was a stretch where Dimitri just found one unbelievably masterful defensive move after another. Yeah, actually... To neutralize Ikaro like that is is is, I mean... If, so impressive. If we go just quickly to that opposite color, one bishop takes c5 happened there. A bishop c6 check was the only move, and it seems counterintuitive because you're giving away your best pawn, but as you're pointing out, king d5 is about to win the game for white, so he had to jettison that pawn to win the h3 pawn, and that saved the day for Dimitri Andrekin. And the fascinating thing is that if Hikaru goes king e5, the point of bishop c6 check is to come around the other way. You take h3, you take g4, and actually only white can lose here because black is gladly going to give up the bishop for white's c-pawn. So Hikaru was forced to drop the king back. And king f6, another incredibly cold blood, blood not rushing with bishop takes h3. The guy's got two seconds, and he's not taking the pawn. <laughs> you, know that's, takes it. Amazing. you know that's a superstar player when you make moves like that. I mean, just all the decision-making was pretty perfect from Dimitri Andrejko. And Hikaru deserves a lot of praise for the way he put pressure on Dimitri from a position that looked better for Black to suddenly not so great. But then F6, King of some G5 for Dimitri. Both sides really showed fabulous chess. The G5 was an amazing move. And, and that sense of when you go for active counterplay and when you need to stay passive, that's a hidden talent that uh that a lot of players don't realize really stands behind some of the greatest defenders in the world they just know which levers to pull and when to pull them just amazing amazing stuff so it seems like the players are getting set for the next game dimitri i'll get the white pieces so let's just talk about overall match strategy hikaru obviously just wants to uh, stabilize and neutralize whatever opening edge dimitri gets we saw dimitri against wesley his opening with white was not particularly impressive. No, he played this sort of C3, A4 line in the Grunfeld. And I think against Hikaru, Dimitri is going to play a little bit more ambitiously. I think he's aware that Yana Pamishi beat him basically with preparation of the Catalan. I'm going to make the prediction that Dimitri pulls out all the stops and plays something more mainstream. We might see a Catalan. We might see a Queen's Gambit decline. But I think Dimitri is going to substantively change his strategy versus his game against Wesley. Okay, I think that's a good Compared. idea for him. I mean, if I were in his corner, I would tell him the same thing because he just sort of was dilly-dallying, meandering against Wesley. He got absolutely nothing, and Wesley was on the verge of outplaying him. But Dimitri, as he just showed in this game, he showed in the first match against Wesley, he puts up sturdy defense when he needs to. But what he he needs to avoid is time trouble against Hikaru mm -hmm. because his connection hasn't been great, and Hikaru is the best at punishing you on the clock. I don't know if Dimitri can survive another one of these end games with, you know, 10 seconds left. So he's going to have to be efficient, fast. The prep will have to be good. And going into an Armageddon with Hikaru is just not the best strategy for success. No, for sure not. And we know Jan Napomnesi, he's waiting in the wings. He does not know who he's going to face yet. Will it be Hikaru Nakamura, the people's champion? And will it be Dimitri Andrejkin, the two-time Russian champion, the superstar in his own right that we keep saying this, and we will keep saying it. He just somehow is overlooked, but here he is, at minimum, a top three finisher in the Rapid Chess Championship. He would like to make that top two. What an impressive result all around. I mean, second place in the overall leaderboard. And uh, second only behind Hikaru Nakamura, who he seeks to vanquish in this second game of their mini-match. We can take a look at Hikaru Nakamura's hired player resume at 34. He needs no introduction. Introduction isn't even the right word. He doesn't... We don't even need to talk about him. I mean, he is among the most famous names in all of chess. He gets recognized on the street. Hikaru is a one-of-a-kind human. Yeah, bringing so many more fans into the game of chess. Uh, he's been streaming, but apparently the stream went down. That was part of the issue. And so trying to make sure that everything is set. And okay, so we uh, are waiting for that. So sorry to everybody. I know you want the games to commence. Right, we do so as well. Do we. <laughs> I think the one person who's actually happy about this delay is Dimitri Andrejkin. He can sure. take a breath because that dude was on his waning seconds against 
Nakamura in that last game. Now he can look at openings a little bit and figure out, do I want to play a Catalan against Hikaru? Is there something in a QGD, a Queen's Gambit decline that he likes? I mean, he can sort of pick his poison at this point and getting a little prep in with the white pieces should be helpful. Yeah, you can attest to this as well. When you're actually playing the tournament, these breaks, they might seem long if you're watching or commentating, but, but when you're playing, you know, it, it, it appears that the game starts instantly. I mean, a five minute break goes by in a millisecond just because just catching your breath takes that long. Yeah, it really does. So Dimitri, he can cool into that. He's also been playing for longer than Hikaru has in terms of today's action because he had to play right. a two game match against Wesley, which was nerve wracking in that second game. He was in big trouble and he did in fact win that to earn his way here. Remind everybody of the brackets. Uh, yeah, you can look where he came from. Yeah, look at that. The gauntlet. From the start, he lost the first match against Abdusatora. Yeah, and then look at the last slate of opponents he had. Fabiano Caruana, Vladimir Fedosev, who's lucky to even have that half point because at the end of that game, it was a courtesy draw for her. He beats Wesley So to make his way through to Hikaru Nakamura. So, uh, wow, what a day it's been from him. Indeed. It's been a tour de force. But now he has the ultimate boss that he needs to vanquish. Hikaru Nakamura, the winner of this game, is going to go on to face Jan Nepomnishi mm -hmm. in the grand finals. Okay, here we go. The game is underway. Dimitri with the white pieces and one knight F3 is his choice. All right, so will he play C4? We get a symmetrical English a la Ding Li Ren. Oh, all right, C4, and then we E6. So that's very standard for Icar. He likes his Queen's Gambit decline positions. He does an E3. Uh, again, Dimitri, you know, going a little bit more conservative here in the early going. And he's kind of doing to Hikaru what Hikaru just did to him, right? If you're, yeah. oh, well, he went knight takes d5 and e4. So this loses a tempo, if you will, compared to if white had played knight c3 earlier, but it limits black's options because there was no knight takes c3 for black. So these little subtleties are really important in the opening stage. I think it's very obvious uh, by Dimitri's opening choice that he's basically trying to play with no risk. Now, yes. he's not trying to make a draw. It's very clear that he's not trying to make a draw. This end game is very combative. All of the pieces other than the Queens are still on the board, essentially. But he also wants to limit oh. his losing chances. And Hikaru offers a draw. And Dimitri and says Dimitri no. declines it. Nope. So that distinction you made is essential because how many times have you played a game, Danya, where you're like, okay, my opponent just trading off pieces. It seems like they want to draw. I'm just going to make a draw in I'm 10 moves. Right. And then you're like, oh, wait, my position actually feels un uncomfortable. So I, I know I've had that plenty of times, and Dimitri is the type of player. And look at this position, by the way. This looks great for White. Like, not oh, uh, anything. Why would he take a draw here? <laughs> no, not anything where Black is losing, but why can't I just play Rook C1, take over the C file, moves like that, and eventually it seems like Black is going to be the one lacking space. No, White is seriously better. I mean, I, I think the ELO bar might be overstating things just a little bit. But I'd also point out that the B6 pawn is a very serious long-term weakness. The big problem in these types of positions is that if you push B5, the medicine is almost worse than the cure. And these weaknesses on the A5 square and on the C5 square, that knight on D4 is perfectly positioned to exploit them. It can drop back to B3 on demand and uh, you know do whatever Andraken needs that knight to do on the queen side. And both players are going to keep their kings in the center because after a move like rook to d1, you have to watch out. Your bishop is loose on d6. So king e7 is played over here. And while the h2 pawn should not be captured, don't go full Bobby Fischer over there. Nope. In, in some variations, maybe it can be taken because you can't easily trap the bishop with g3. There could be a knight h5 at some point. So just things to keep in mind that h2 typically not capturable. Here, there might be a moment where... You're not looking, and it's scooped up. Yeah, I would go so far as to say that this is something Andraken has to reckon with right now. And precisely for the reason you outlined, if white goes g3, there's a weird knight h5 move, and you actually have a hard time defending the g3 pawn. So a uh, standard move for... Oh, I was going to say standard move for white. I think white. he blundered it. Wow, what's... Although after bishop h2, there's also the move f4. So it's not just g3, but f4 also locks the bishop in there. But then there's like knight c5, oh, and I goodness. guess you play bishop f3, but it gets incredibly sharp. And Hikaru's the kind of guy who will take on h2 if he thinks it works. He's not just going to say, ah, Dimitri probably saw something there. He never does that. Not Hikaru. No. 
No, he's going to spend quite a lot of time calculating that right now because if he can take on H2, now he gets the upper hand because Dimitri has to prove that this was a sacrifice, not a blunder. I mean, I, my guess is that Dimitri just quickly looked at this, said, I play G3, and stopped his calculation there. Knight F6 to H5 is a very unconventional type of resource, and we know that even the top of the top, even these players, they, on occasion, are capable of missing a resource like that. But this is the problem with playing with your intuition rather than with Ooh. your calculation. And Picard does not take. Why is it? And I mean, that's something that maybe we could dive into a bit, a bit because that position uh, was fascinating with the possibility to stay, take on H2. And that possibility is still there. But now if you take on H2, I can show this really quickly. After G3, Knight H5, there is a key difference. The Knight on D7 is now X-rayed by the Rooks. And knight f5 check is absolutely devastating. That's a key difference. So if we look at bishop h2 first, instead of this uh, rook c8 move. Right. So is f4 the right play or g3? I think f4 is the right move. And just to show the point, if black takes on e4 hungrily, at the end of the day, white plays rook h1 and traps the bishop this way. Still not the end of the game. White Black has like e5 and stuff, but this looks very dubious for black. Yeah, and maybe there was something that was a little more precise from White, but the point is the bishop gets trapped over there. So that understandably is what Hikaru wanted to avoid because you're sort of walking on eggshells throughout the rest of the game where you're like, uh oh, I mean, I, maybe I'm going to get out there. Maybe it can't get trapped, but you're just so nervous and spending all of your energy with that bishop. So Hikaru probably believes in the stability, the foundation of this position, but I believe that White is just slightly better. And so this is exactly what Dimitri wants. And that's exactly what I wanted to say. I don't think Hikaru feels desperate enough to take on H2. I think he's very confident that he'll be able to make a draw here, and he's confident in his Armageddon chances. So we can see from the opening that he chose and the way he's playing this game that he's determined to sign the peace accords and to get into an Armageddon, and he's not going to do anything drastic unless he is very confident that uh, it's going to work out. Well, something drastic that I'm wondering about is bishop takes c3, followed like a bishop takes e4, an actual option oh. for black, because you're getting two pawns and a rook for two minor pieces. But with the king on e7 in the center, I feel like the minor pieces are going to shine for white. And that's exactly why Dimitri makes his g4 move, because you're trying to remove the guard of the knight on d7. Dino, you showed some excellent tactics regarding this hanging piece on d7. And so if you try some kind of bishop takes c3, Bishop takes e4 stuff now. I guess the point is that white just has g5 and says, you're not even getting your uh, rook for those minor pieces. I'm just winning the minor piece. Such a cool idea. And this is almost indirect prophylaxis. So many players, if they would have gotten scared of bishop c3, bishop e4, they would have made a move like bishop d3 or move their king away. But top players, they know how to weave prophylaxis naturally into uh, the way that they play so that they don't disrupt the coordination of their pieces in any way. Now, G4, it's a pretty committal move from a positional standpoint, but it's also really annoying. I mean, G5 is an all-out threat right now. Yes, so H6 would be my first instinct. That's how I'm going to deal with this pawn push. And I don't think Black should be afraid of White fully sending with H4 and G5, but instead, Icaro just brings his rook to D8. He's like, I have everything defended now. So I know G5... Yeah, the G5 will kick my knight back to a square like E8, but that's not the end of the world, and I can keep maneuvering my pieces. Yeah, and eventually White might bite off more than he can chew if White keeps pushing these kingside pawns up the board in some later endgame when a couple pieces come off the board. White might regret that, but Hikaru, he sticks Whoa. the knight on H5. That I, is definitely surprising. I don't love that, because as White here, uh -huh. one thing to note is the C3 I'm going to call it the c3 pawn in the event of bishop c3 pawn takes rook takes c3. There are many positions where that leaves the rook on d8 and the knight on d7 in trouble. So, Ooh. like, for example, if I play knight b3 here, or knight c2, it would actually uh -huh. even more forcing. Knight c2 is better. Oh, I like your knight c2 move. Okay. And then take on c3. You can't easily take twice in this position, I feel like, because of bishop b6 tactics. Maybe not right away because c2 is also hanging, but the point is that you're hanging by a thread here as black. Right, and there's ideas of f4, bishop d4, bishop f6. I mean, oh, White's got an abundance of different ideas here. Uh, but And, and Andraken plays your move. He plays knight b3, and I think the reason why is he wants to discourage 
uh, the move bishop b4 to c5. So this makes this makes a lot of sense to me as well. And, and he wants the knight to be poised to exploit the a5 square. Right. And it's, it's, and his knight on h5, it's just offside over here, and it is looking particularly dim. So knights on the rim are kind of, you know, they're, they're it's not unfair how much they're bullied, but I'm not enjoying the knight on h5 in this game. Dimitri could not ask for a better endgame here. He's up on time. He's got a better position. He's not risking at all. He's basically playing for two results as of this moment. Yeah. And he's got Ikaru in a very uncomfortable spot. And he wants that move B5 to be played because as soon as B5 is played, I look at that A5 square and I play the move A3. Just you take my knight on C3. You win that pawn. Have fun with it because I am going to infiltrate on the dark squares and mm -hmm. you're the pressure on the d-file will be probably too much to bear. So I, I think Hikaru needs to find an only plan. Not necessarily an only move here, but he needs to find a plan so he doesn't just get pushed back and kind of crushed. Yeah, the bishop on b4 also doesn't have any real estate along this diagonal. So one idea would be to drop the king back. Whoa. Hikaru solves the problem radically. He just gives the bishop up. Ivalvar, not a fan of that. Yeah, I can understand why. I mean, look at this he position. He wants knight f4. Right. But can white go rook d6 here? Looks is very that interesting. The move? Also, or is there something? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bishop f1. Okay. And if knight f4, can I take on f4 and take on d7? And then bishop h3 check at the end? How does that work? So you take here? I was thinking no, about why, that. Oh. No, no, just bishop h3, I think. Just bishop h3 first? I mean, you've got black. Oh, yeah, you're really pinned forever. Knots. Or, or, God, it's plus five here. What's the move? Is it knight d4 first, trying to go to f5? Oh, it's just knight d4. And is it knight e2 and knight takes f4? I think this might be the idea, just going okay. after this pawn. And that's plus five? <laughs> Apparently, that's plus six almost. Oh, yes, my course. gosh. How could you not realize that? Bishop h3 and then knight e2. But Man. this is Shame this on is me. Tough. No, I, bishop I was, f1 is findable, though. No, bishop f1, I was just trying to go to this endgame thinking that a knight against bishop could lead me to a promising endgame, especially with your pawn on f4 as a target. Mm -hmm. uh, but I might I misevaluated that. I didn't definitely did not see a plus six variation with the, right. just a simple knight d4 move. Bishop f1 is such a dangerous move. This maneuver is... Oh, this is Played. concerning, and he plays it. Wow. Uh-oh. And Hikaru has to, he's walking on hot coals right now. Knight f4 really is plus six. Amazing. It's Those... crazy how that just happens. Like you just, you know, these positions, are, you think, okay, plus one, plus two, maybe. No, plus six. No, I mean, no, no, is totally paralyzed. That's but, the point. But no player thinks like that, right? No player's like, no, oh, no. this is this winning for me. No, I've got great winning chances. But it's just shocking when I hear numbers like that in a position that looks just better for white, but not completely and utterly winning. Uh, so what, what does Hikaru do? Yeah, that's what I was about to ask you. Right. Because Bishop H3 is like a winning threat. Yeah, it, black will be up tied in complete knots and probably also losing a ton of material. I mean, B6 is going to fall at some point. It's always the problem that pushing B5 is totally out of the question makes way too many weaknesses on the queen side i don't see a move you, you asked me what does black do i really am not finding a move here so that i guess we might have to go back to that ending where does black actually have chances being down upon there I mean, it's objectively terrible but maybe there's some Plays practical it. chances yeah I, I guess you and he was bishop h3 so knight d4 not seen he rushed it a little bit, and bishop c6 is excellent. Now if he plays knight d4, the bishop has this a4 hiding spot. And I think the situation becomes a little bit more complicated. Wow. But bishop h3 was such a natural move. Yeah, no, you cannot blame Dimitri for playing bishop h3. But if he took a little bit longer, he might have spotted bishop c6, and then that would have given him a chance to see knight d4. It's true. I think white would have just tied black up all together in knots as you like to say so here bishop a4 where is the rook going to is he going to take oh, on d7 yes bishop takes d7 i think wins a pawn for white right Ooh, a 92 and he finds that as well and yeah if, if oh. rook takes d7 there was knight f5 check 92 this is really 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 bad for hikaru because here's the thing robert he's gonna have to move his bishop and 
that dovetails in with your point earlier. They're going to get a knight versus bishop endgame where Dimitri has a four on three on the king side. This should be completely winning. No, the, the knight versus bishop ending, that I was confident was winning. That's what I was aiming for to begin with. So Hikaru quickly took on d7 with the bishop, and that was maybe a, a game-changing mistake. It seemed that rook takes d7 still gave chance, but that looked bad after knight f5 check. So I can't really blame Hikaru too much for quickly taking with the bishop, even if it is objectively losing. And he drops the king back to e8, trying to make it as difficult as possible for Dimitri to win this pawn. With the king on e7, knight takes f4 was an immediate threat because you could not take on c3 due to the fork on d5. Now you can. Yeah, but knight f4 rooks... Okay, so Dimitri goes rook d6, which is good. But if knight f4 rooks, it was knight h5 going in the other direction oh. and winning material. Great catch as well. But I like Dimitri's move. He keeps the status quo... He's just stepping on Hikaru's toes here. Well, this is, I think, the best move by Dimitri. And the reason why is C3 is defended, B6 is under attack. And if you move the bishop, we just transpose to exactly what we were looking at a moment ago, a winning minor piece ending for white. So we have a minute delay from Hikaru's stream video to you know, what, where we're at. But what we're not delayed about is this lead on the clock for Andrik. Oh, He's double gosh. Hikaru's time in addition to having a winning a position. Winning position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here we go. This again. No, I have nothing to say. There are no moves. I mean, look at the defile pressure. The F4 pawn is about to fall. Hikaru might have nothing better than going into this knight versus bishop endgame. And what exacerbates the problem in that endgame, is that White's two queenside pawns will both be on dark squares. They can't even be attacked. I was going to say, I think b5 might be the best practical chance. And Dimitri doing the smart thing. He's not just taking on a6. He brought his rook up to take some pawns over there. But that may give Black the opportunity to get some counterplay, where you might be down one pawn, maybe two. But if you have some things to counter with, then you're feeling better. We, we you know, we've said it countless times at this point that you much prefer to be down material with some play and if you just play knight takes f4, rook takes you through knight h5, Danya, that looks just over. No, you're, I agree completely, but Dimitri <laughs> doesn't hurry. He just plays h4. This was Russian school of chess move ever. Yes, he's making all these little improvements. g5 now defended, just in case. And he's probably going to play a3 too. That would be very consistent oh with the strategy. Oh my gosh. But eventually he's going to have to press some sort of a button. Right, to play a3, rook d1 to d2, move the king somewhere. Or and then d1 to d3. But if he doesn't play a3, then Hikaru plays b4 and fixes the pawn on a light square. I think it's actually quite important for Dimitri to go a3 here or to take on f4 and go knight h5. One or the other. <laughs> of course, rook d2. Rook and he d2, did this for I a reason. Because if b4 is played, he'll take on b4 and then take on f4, and now there's no rook takes c3. So he was worried about rook takes c3. Oh, he forgot. might not be focusing on knight h5. It is a bit obscure. We just saw how bad black's knight was on h5, but now the white knight would be an aggressor rather than just an offside piece. I think he's basically intent on forcing this into the minor piece endgame, and he's going to try to engineer the situation. a3 might have been a mistake, though. Hikaru has saved these positions in the past. But what can Black do? Like, what if he just so keeps doing... What can doing... White do? Take on f4 eventually and just go knight h5? Yeah. So, but what do you do in this position? Rook d3? I... I if Hikaru saves this, I mean... No, I mean, this is... I have a feeling he's going to draw this. He's down two minutes on the clock, and he can't move any of his pieces. Oh, wait a second, though. But Black's about to go rook d8 to c8. Yeah, but then the bishop will hang if you take on c3. No, no, but then you move the bishop. You get to keep the pieces on the board. Right. Oh, okay. Which is why Dimitri, he kind of stalled a little bit too long, and Hikaru is starting to unwind his tentacles just a little bit. And that's the thing, right? Some players, they are a little bit too methodical, and he plays h5, which... Whoa! Oh, he's trying to shove the pawn down to h6 to carve out this massive hole on f6 okay that actually knight. that's good technique and if rook c8 now rook d8 to see that is he'll take on f4 because the rook can't take on c3 d7 is hanging and he does and hikaru drops the rook away to b7 h6 h6 is the move that's yeah, definitely it, the move it just wins it just wins 
<laughs> oh gosh, this again. Dimitri <laughs> doesn't play H6. He's I, I, just I, I, eliminating I, every ounce of counterplay. Yeah, I, I have to say, like it's sort of amusing, but not because I'm laughing at anyone, but because I know how miserable it feels to play these type of positions against someone like Andrake. Uh, right. They're they're Does boa it, constrictors. Breathe. It's like every single move is with purpose and you have no counterplay whatsoever. Okay, H6 time. It, and it you feels know good. what the end result of the game is going to be. You know where this is all going, but yeah, H6 is a total no-brainer. He's got to play it. I mean, that's why he played H5, presumably, to play H6. <laughs> I, I assume so, but now he's not moving. There it goes. There he goes, G6, and so he, he just needs one or two more accurate moves. What he, are they? Knight D5 check, not accurate because you blunder your rook on D6, <laughs> yeah. so move that rook out of the way. Where do you put it? Rook F6. Maybe not F6, because you want that square belonging to the knight. Right. Maybe Rook A6. Another idea is to go Rook D5 and Rook E5. A little bit obscure, but potentially a good way to apportion the squares. That looks pretty clever, actually. He is down at two minutes. That is Hikaru's only hope. Only hope that Dimitri gets low on time and gets nervous. It's amazing that we say that when Hikaru himself is down under a minute, but that's I how know. good Hikaru is. He's the bullet chess champion. He has won crazier positions than this. Bishop Rooks. C6. I would check and then go to C5. I'm not sure. Yes, I like that because it, there's some back rank checks that Black needs to be careful about now. And now the Andrakin way to play this would be to play like King E3. <laughs> right? He goes Rook D6, infiltrating further. Oh my gosh. After Bishop B7, he's probably going to play like Rook D8 check. Oh, oh my goodness. E f no, rook f6. Now that's why he carved that square out. Okay, so is he going to... Oh! Is he going to take on b over. Yeah, rook takes b5. You can't take c3 without losing f7. Yeah, that's another pawn, and he takes it. This is... 90 96 check is unnecessary because of king e7. Wow, he yeah, just... This is... He has prevented Hikaru from doing anything. He's eating him alive. Okay, what's the finishing blow? Is it 92? Just dropping the knight back, keeping the pawn alive? Maybe knight. Okay, knight. Oh, my god. <laughs> 92. Why give up the C3 <laughs> pawn? Why give him any counterplay? This Look at that bishop. This has been a master class. Okay, and he just, and Hikaru, he won't die. We know he just, every it's... move, he'll keep it as difficult as possible. Oh, my gosh. Let me see if rook B4 next. Another amazing idea. Gosh, the guy just, he, he's such great full board awareness. Like, he has done a tremendous job of giving Hikaru zero counterplay. Yeah, he's taken him completely out of commission. And King E3 is going to come at some moment. I can feel it. <laughs> like right now? Like right now. Or Rook B4. I don't see a problem with that. No. Rook B4. There is no problem with Rook B4. Rook B4 actually ends the game. And he plays it. Goodness. Is I this mean, resign time? You know how they say a picture is worth a thousand words? This mm -hmm. demonstration of chess excellence is worth all the words I've ever said in commentary. Yeah, I'm speechless. You're absolutely right. It was... Even it this! Continues. Right, it was just like the way the filigree <laughs> precision with which he just deprives Hikaru of even a chance to attack a pawn. Right, rook d4 check, threat. rook d5. Let's offer a trade. We're up three pawns right now. But he's down under a minute. And king g3 continues to improve his position. Hammer away at Hikaru's pieces. Oh my gosh, and pinning the bishop on knight d4 is probably winning, but he might not even want to give up the c3 pawn, so he'll play some other move. Just like a check on d4 <laughs> and knight f4. Yeah, centralization is important. Beautiful. Knight f4. My gosh. Rookie Hikaru, eight check now will not go away. No, but you Rookie gotta four. tip your hat to him. It's fifty four moves in. Is he Where gonna go? Is... He goes ninety two. Oh my yeah. god, the guy is insane. He just doesn't give him even a single chance to take a piece. A four. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or Rook H eight. Yeah, Rook H eight is too. No, it's, no Rook H eight is too A4. active. Four. Rookie. Don't drop your G5 pawn. Oh, yeah, that would be the best way to complicate the game. 
Yeah, so he just goes like this. He's up three pawns in a rook end game. It's over. Anything wins. King b6, rook b8. He's got plenty of time. And b6. Nope. Rook h8. Rook h8. Whoa, look at this. Look at this. Just an unbelievable display of technique from Dimitri Andrejka. Ikaro is going to be upset, but we all have to tip our hat. This was... Would it be an exaggeration to say that this is one of the greatest positional rapid games we've ever seen? It, it was pure class from Dimitri Andrejka. And the game technically is not over, but when you're up four pawns in a rook end yeah. game, it doesn't matter if you're playing... The only... A... Go just ahead. don't go king e5 and blunder f6. Oh, that would be tragic. And you might still be winning. <laughs> yeah, well, he still is completely winning, actually. <laughs> Look at c4. Make sure the f3 pawn is safe and sound. Rook, Rook h8, h8, h7. h7. And the death bell starts to sound. Rook c8 check, I'm C8. sure he'll go. King d4, Hikaru with one last attempt to get blacks and whites king to a mating net. But there's nothing b6. Oh! Oh, Ikaru, is, trying. He's trying. Is there a mating net? Like, just if he just plays B7? B7? Just play B7. Oh, King G3. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She's just toying with him at this point. Oh, Rook A7. That's it. Dimitri Andrik. And look at him. Did oh you see God. that? And now he, he has to play Jan. <laughs> right, but he just took down Wesley So and Hikaru Nakamura back-to-back -back in completely different ways. He beat Wesley in a tactical melee. He takes down Hikaru Nakamura in one of the finest positional displays you will ever see in a game of chess. And now his reward is a showdown with Jan Napomashi. That was such a treat. We were watching a master at work. He gave Hikaru zero, zero counterplay and once he got that small end game advantage he chiseled and maneuvered and maneuvered and maneuvered and kept squeezing it out until hikaru just had no life left among his ranks oh my god that was simply breathtaking even simply, if, no matter who who you're rooting for that was amazing even in that last can we just go back to when hikaru went f6 just you know two moves ago right or whatever that was. Like, the yep. point for Hikaru is he wants, like, a rook g1, rook f7, and a checkmate on that king on f4. Some kind of weird configuration. It's like a self-mate. But Dimitri goes king g3, so right. he doesn't have to worry about his king safety. Every single move by Dimitri Andrikin had purpose. And, I mean, that's really the only way you can knock out Hikaru Nakamura. I just want to point out knight f4 to e2, the oh retreating God. knight move going to d4 and b5. Defending C3, he didn't give away a single one of his extra pawns. And it wasn't just because he was being aimlessly greedy. He was being ridiculously precise. And Hikaru Nakamura offered a draw to Dimitri Andrekin early on this game. As you called, you're the prophet for a reason. Dimitri isn't playing a queenless position to make a draw. He's playing it so he doesn't have to risk any tactical opportunities from Hikaru's perspective. And what a game that was. So... That sets us up for the grand finals. We know who our remaining two competitors are. It is Jan Nepomshi, who has gone unblemished throughout the Rapid Chess Championship finals. And now we know he takes on Dimitri Andrekin, who made it through the loser's bracket. Danya, what a treat. Well, the RCC has been a treat all 25 week regular season long. These four day finals have flown by and I cannot wait for these grand finals. My seatbelt is fastened, it is tightly fastened, and I suggest that you do the same if you know what's good for you. Well, I'm gonna stretch my legs because I know we're in for so much more exciting chess. This is the Rapid Chess Championship Finals presented by Coinbase. We'll be right back for the grand final between Yana Pomshi and Dimitri Andre.
And here we are back at the Rapid Chess Championship Finals presented by Coinbase. We are ready for the Grand Finals. Now, Dimitri Andrekin, he gets a well-deserved break, Danya. He gets a few minutes to uh, recuperate from two very difficult matches. I don't know. That's kind of really asking a lot. Very demanding, you know. <laughs> he wants a five-minute break after he defeats Wesley and Hikaru in two successive masterpieces. And yeah, I, mean, I don't know why we gave it to him. What a guy, but the format is grueling. It is demanding because he needs to win two matches in a row as he takes on Jan Napomchi because Jan Napomchi, he is the winner's bracket victor. And we just found out on Draken is his challenger and they will play typical matches, two games, white and black in the 10 minute plus two second increment. The difference being that Jan Napomchi needs just one victory and on mm -hmm. needs to do it twice. And obviously, all the cliches apply. Andreka needs to go one match at a time. He needs to almost tell himself that he needs to win one match. And then when he wins the first one, he just needs to do the same thing again. Pretty easy. Just beat Jan twice. Like I said at the start, how easy can it, how much easier can it get? Oh, yeah, no, that sounds like the biggest challenge you could give someone right now. Jan Napomnishi is a man on fire, winning the candidates just going through the gauntlet here at the Rapid Chess Championship, but he has a tough match in store against Dimitri Andrikin. So while the players, they get set, we are very happy to share with you these great video from chess, the history of chess, a reflection of us. So stay tuned. We'll be back for more from the RCC, but enjoy this video in the meantime. Dating back to 6th century India, Shaturanga is the earliest known form of chess and bore similarities to today's game. Variations of the game spread to the Sassanid Empire, or modern-day Iran, where they were taught to nobility. After hundreds of years, these early versions slowly converged into the modern game we enjoy today. Chess traveled east, to China, where it evolved into a game called Xianqi. The game also traveled west, as Islam swept through Arabia, North Africa, and the Iberian Peninsula. By the Middle Ages, chess was being played throughout Europe. The game reached Mongolia through Silk Road routes, and Genghis Khan spread chess throughout the empire in the 1200s. As the European Renaissance ushered in an era of rebirth, chess became popular with the artists, scientists, and religious leaders who dominated Renaissance culture. In fact, it was a Catholic priest, Rui Lopez de Segura, who in 1561, published one of the earliest and most influential books on the game, which documented the priest's opening theories, including his namesake, the Ruy Lopez, which is still a common opening nearly 500 years later. The 18th century ushered in an era of revolutions, most notably on the American continent, in France, and even in global industry. Napoleon Bonaparte was known to play chess with his generals. Benjamin Franklin, a founding father of the United States, was an avid chess player who penned the essay, The Morals of Chess, in 1786, where he wrote, Life is a kind of chess, in which we have often points to gain and competitors or adversaries to contend with. Today, Chess.com is excited to release The History of Chess, A Reflection of Us. Chess.com's documentary tells the full story of chess from its origin in India to its diffusion throughout the world and into the modern era. Learn about the champions who have defined the game, such as Paul Morphy, Bobby Fischer, Gary Kasparov, and Magnus Carlsen from some of the game's greatest players and commentators, including Vishwanathan Anand, Bruce Pandolfini, Ben Feingold, and Danny Wrench. Watch the premiere today immediately after the show at go.chess.com slash history of chess. Again, that will be available after today's show here in the Rapid Chess Championship because all eyes should be on these two players, Dmitry Andrekin, Jan Nepomnesi. And you see the L next to Andrekin's name here, Daniel, not because that's what we expect from him, but that's where he came from. He came from the loser's bracket, not just from the loser's bracket, from the very beginning of that bracket. What an incredible journey he had. And if we take one more look at our bracket to refresh our memory here, 
over way on the bottom left, eons and millennia ago, one day in the 16th century, Dimitri Andrejkin had to defeat Fabiano Caruana in the first in the first uh, part of the loser's bracket. He went all the way defeating Caruana, Vladimir Fedoseev, Wesley So, and Hikaru Nakamura, and now has to defeat Jan Nepomnyshi two times in a row. And that doesn't even include his earlier wins over Jeffrey Zhang in the loser's right. bracket. Like, the guy went through everybody possible because, as you pointed out, against Nordivek Abdusitarov, an uncharacteristic double blunder. He blundered minor pieces in both games. And then, as you see on the screen in front of you, he beat Paravian. He beat Zhang. He beat Caruana. He beat Fedoseev. So, and Nakamura. Can we just, like, anoint this guy the world champion at that point? You know, that <laughs> that's ridiculous. Right. No, this is one of the greatest uh, online chess runs ever. Ever. I mean, nobody's managed to do that. And this no. we're not talking about a bullet tournament here. We're not talking about, you know, 3 plus 0 or Title Tuesday. We're talking about serious 10 plus 2 mini matches in which he's beating these people. Incredible. I mean, the way he's played has just been a sight to behold. And now he is... Yay playing game one with the white pieces against Yana Pomshi he goes for knight f3. Against a fresh Yana Pomshi. A very fresh Yana Pomshi. And, and uh, Yana Pomshi who has not lost the match to this point. That's right. And Yana Pomshi who won the candidate tournament and is supremely confident. So Dimitri, he's got the white pieces in game one here. He repeats the same opening from game two against Nikaro. He has to keep his foot on the gas pedal. He can't give the white game away because Yana has been completely unstoppable with the white pieces. And Jan's preparation has been spectacular, and that's an understatement. The way that Jan beat Hikaru Nakamura in that bounce back game two with that deep Catalan preparation with the exchange sacrifice for a couple pawns, that was something. And right now, Dimitri is doing the most Dimitri thing ever. Right. He's just saying, let's play in a position that I feel comfortable in, not tactical at all. Let me outplay you in just this could... casual game. But it could get tactical because White's typical idea in such positions is to play b2, b4. Fi and Ghetto the bishop on b2. And White's pieces come into the center very, very quickly. So what you will sometimes see is once the knight moves away from c3, if White can get the bishop to b2 in a timely fashion, threats could be made against Black's king. That's, that is true, for sure. And what I'm noticing, in addition to the plans you mentioned, is that Yana Pamshi, he's spending quite a deal of time at this point. He mm -hmm. doesn't want to choose the wrong plan because in this position, does this plan bring the knight to d7 as he just played or knight to c6? Those are important questions that you can't answer later. You need to figure it out right now. And of course, this all leads into the big question of how to develop the light squared bishop. My guess is that Jan will play b6 and bishop b7. He wants to do the same thing Dimitri wants to do. So we might see both sides developing their minor pieces in a very, very similar manner. And later on down the line, Jan could try to stick a rook on c8 and really challenge all of Dimitri's pieces on the c-file. And as you're pointing out, the bishop is going to be fianchettoed. Sometimes you play a6, b5. Other times you just settle for b6. These little, yeah, it's yeah, these little things, they're really consequential. Now, yeah, such as where you develop your pieces. Eh. It doesn't really matter. Not against <laughs> someone like Dimitri Andre. He's not going to punish you for wrong development. No, no, no. He doesn't care. He's just uh, happy to be here. And right. he gets minimum $20,000. Second place in this event, 20 k And it's very deserved for whoever ends up in second. But right now, Yann Pomashi with the black pieces, he also just has the benefit of you know, he can lose the first match. He'll get that rematch. Dimitri Andre does not have that same right. Right. But there will be huge momentum on Dimitri's side if he can win the first match. So Jan, from his perspective, he wants to end it right here and right now. He definitely does. And I think that Dimitri has many new fans. I don't think after this, we're going to have to say, oh, people overlook Dimitri. Nah, he's getting Not anymore. the credit and the respect that he deserves. But right now, his position, he plays e4, which is a big move because with the queen on c2, you were indicating this before down here. Look at the h7 pawn. Maybe there's an e5, a knight g5, and white's pieces spring to life. Dima is going after him, and that explains Jan's move queen c7, preventing e5, and of course, aiming at the h2 pawn. But this is more of a defensive move than an aggressive move. It also poses the potential threat of bishop takes f2 check. 
That's right. So knight b5 kind of takes care of multiple issues at once. You attack the black queen, and it's not just to attack the queen. It stops your bishop f2 check because the queen now protects the bishop on c4. And then I'm going to follow up with pawn to b4, bishop to b2. And I feel like white is gaining important space. From an aesthetic visual, visual perspective, I agree completely. I think white's position looks more pleasant. What could be the other candidate move here other than knight b5? Do you see um, anything that catches your eye? No, no. <laughs> neither, neither does Dimitri. Yeah, no, I was I wanted to play B4 and I couldn't do that without dropping F2 in a moment ago. So now B4 is a very nice move. Yeah, I cannot imagine Andre can playing anything else. E5 clearly doesn't work. Uh, one important detail, E5, knight takes E5, bishop F4 never works in such positions because knight takes F3 is always check. That's good to point out. So what is Dimitri thinking about? Because isn't the whole purpose of this opening to play the move B4? Why they hired the commentators that they did for this tournament? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a reasonable thought. <laughs> well, maybe he's thinking of Rook... No, but Rook D1 weakens the F2 pawn, and it doesn't really pose any obvious threats. And, and then Black will happily play A6, ah. Bishop B7, and so on. No, I was thinking maybe he wants some Bishop G5, Bishop H4, Bishop G3, the open, <laughs> but that's way too slow. And he just burned, like, a solid... 90 seconds on these last two moves yeah it, it's very strange because you know you play knight b5 b4 was the follow-up and he could have made the not knight b5 but he could have played b4 instantly and instead he is giving himself a two-minute hole two and a half minute hole at this point right and i would argue that bishop b2 is another very natural move that i would be playing pretty quickly maybe he's gonna go for your bishop g5 bishop h4 bishop maybe. g3 maneuver and it, that's been made more appealing, right, by the fact that there is a black bishop on e7, because at some point later down the line, e5 could become a semi-dangerous idea as well. That's right. So I'm a little concerned about Dimitri's clock management thus far, and I wonder if fatigue could be setting in, because it, even though it's been, what, two hours of chess, just the stress of playing Wesley So and Ikaro Nakamura, I mean, that adds up. And so Dimitri, you know, he's a great player. He's played uh, blitz matches for hours and hours and hours, but you have to recognize he's human after all. He definitely is. And right now he's facing an unbelievably confident Jan who is once again playing with unbelievable confidence. He's only spent a minute. And do you get the feeling that Jan's pieces just breathe? They just, they just flow. It's like watching Steph Curry when he's on. Every piece... <laughs> is of course i had to nerd out with a basketball analogy it's all good but you know. you know what i mean every piece is on a perfect square there's just a certain oomph to his play that makes it so fun to watch and i think we both agree it's not just this game it's just the new Jan napanchi yeah. over the last few years and it's weird to say that somebody who's number three in the world by rating and <laughs> he might be underrated but i think the way he's been playing the maturity he shows and just the a cohesiveness of his plans Great and of his word. clock management. I think that, yeah, he is really just a menace on the chessboard right now. And Dimitri Andrekin, he just brought Bishop back to D3. I think he's telegraphing what his intentions are, E5. But Black could just play Rook C8 and does just that. Are you really going to play Queen B1? No, so Queen E2. So I don't know. I don't feel like Dimitri is as harmonious of a plan right now. Well... I remember my coach teaching me that E4 in such positions tends to be an incredibly risky move because you weaken the entire complex of dark squares around the center, and you also limit the prospects for your bid. There we go. Case in point. Knight H5, aiming for F4. But what is Jan's follow-up going to be here? He's induced G3, but uh, was that a little bit of the old Jan there, Robert? Yeah, we were just talking about how harmonious and cohesive his pieces were. That move is a knight on the rim that isn't looking very good. And I think that white can play e5 soon, which might strand that knight on h5. And you have to be very careful that you're not walking into a vicious attack. I know e5 does not look promising, just based on the fact there's a bishop on b7 slicing across the position. But when a knight is trapped on h5, it can be worth going for. I think that's a prudent decision by Jan to go back, but he has just invested two Tempe in inducing a move that arguably isn't even harmful. I'm not sure that G3 creates any further appreciable weaknesses in White's position. This gives Dimitri a golden tempo that he can use 
to bring a rook into the game. Rook AD1, rook FE1. And in the grand scheme of things, that's a pretty big deal. And I know today's not Thursday, but I hope that Dimitri's enjoying himself a little throwback because if we just go back two games or two matches ago, actually, against Wesley. So remember what Wesley did. He went knight right. C5, knight A4, and Jan just went knight H5, knight F6, and it gave Dimitri the time he needs to launch an attack. I mean, knight G5, pawn E5, these kind of ideas might really be harmful for Black's King. I like that move, though. A7, A5, chipping, nibbling away at the edges, trying to carve out the C5 square for his knight. And I think that Jan's primary strategy should be to launch a direct attack against this E4 pawn, if that is possible. This poses Dimitri with a difficult challenge. How is he going to defend the B4 pawn? Is he going to defend it at all? I feel like there are some Moran lines like this, so bear with me for a second. Knight G5. Okay. If you put h6, can I put knight takes f7? Woo! You know, like these type of sacrifices where you yeah, then play yeah, e5. Like e5. And is That's... it equal? Is it zeros? It does of course. <laughs> of course. According to our the theory that we developed <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Such positions are always the same evaluation. Yeah, like it's super unclear. The king is not safe. But it's just zeros. And there's even this move, bishop h7, oh, I, to I, stop I, the king I, from escaping. I won't pretend like I saw bishop h7 as a concept. Knight g... Okay, this is what's happening. Oh my god, you called it. You called it. Knight g5 is on the board. I can't believe it. But you know and exactly what, about, what I'm talking about, right? Those Moran lines and like the Botvinnik yeah, sometimes. Yeah, Vesel and Topalov also. Yeah, exactly. That's who I was thinking about, Topalov. Topalov against Kramnik had a very famous game where he just sacked on f7 ran seemingly at random in the opening and didn't even seem to have a clear follow-up. And yet the permanent weakness of the king is often the sole motivation for these types of sacrifices. And they're unbelievably difficult to face practically. I love the move knight g5. Can black respond with knight e5? Do you have to play h6? Are you... I, I guess knight e5, but I'm wondering if I can just like bishop back an f4 and maybe you're inviting too many of my pieces into the attack that would be my main concern mm. yeah that's actually a wait idea. knight e5 maybe just bishop e5 and followed by f4 oh and then quickly you just steamroll me with e5 <laughs> yeah you need you don't even need your dark square bishop which is crazy but true yeah that's why at first i was like oh i'll move my light square bishop back but no i can as we're showing we can just sure. take and push pawns forward and win the game. So Jan Napomshi, the fact that he builds up a big lead on the clock is huge right. for him. But here it comes. H6 play, knight takes f7. Maybe you don't have to take on f7, but that's where my eyes are glued. Well, the other move is the immediate uh, e4, e5 counterattack in the knight, which leads to complete and utter chaos. The black queen could get trapped in that line, by the way. If you oh. play e5 here, h, g, e, f looks totally innocuous. Knight takes f6. What's the big deal? The big deal is that the queen is trapped on b8 in this line. And if you play bishop takes f6, well, that's a much inferior version. There's knight d6. There's all sorts of shenanigans here that white has. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, just a position that's starting to look very difficult for black. But what I don't like for Dimitri Andrekin is that he's down to three minutes. Jan has time to work through the complications. Dimitri, he's going to have to trust his intuition a little bit more, but he's not doing that, right? He's... He's deliberating, which is great. As a chess commentator, as a coach, we say, right. clap, clap our hands. You know, you should be calculating. But now you have two minutes and 45 seconds. Yeah, and navigating the Byzantine complexities of that position is going to be an incredibly tall order, even with six minutes. And there it is, the sack on F7. You called it straight oh, away. Did you see Jan? I don't think he fully expected this. He has the not impressed face on. <laughs> yeah. He just took a sip of his tea. I don't think he's too unhappy to see this. He knows this is going to give him winning chances. He knows that if this backfires, this will probably lose. And he knows that Dima is in time pressure. So if he chaos. does Bishop H7 oh. here, Danya, I would just like quit. And he didn't right. do it. That you would know, be just... nuts. The most so inhuman move ever, Bishop H7. Does Black take the opportunity then to escape to G8? No, Jan simply takes on before as if nothing is the matter. As if F5 is not coming on this on the next move. That's uh -oh. why he Bishop showed... Bishop C5 check! Bishop C5 oh! check! Oh! Oh no! I think that's a crusher. Yeah, it is. And Jan finds it pretty much immediately. Oh, uh, Dimitri completely forgot about that. He can't move his king because the other bishop kills the king there with knight F4 check. Oh, and then this is just over then. 
Bishop, if your best move is bishop d4, knight c3 now. Take oh. advantage of a pin piece. Oh, f takes c6, you just drop the king back to g8. That was my plan. And you say, my king is as safe as it gets. What about yours? And Whoa, now, but Yanni rushed it. Wait, so f takes c6? f takes you double check. King and g8 if, and e takes d7. Wait, what is, actually, what did he just do here? And uh, when everything is said and done, Robert, when you take th three times on d4, white plays rook f2, and guess what? The threat of bishop h7 check is going to get white right back into the game. And you asked about the yawn of old. This is, is one of those of examples. Old. He has so much time remaining. Five, Five minutes. minutes. Take a minute, because if you find one move, the game is over on Drake and Resigns. You win the RCC, basically. Yes, and now all of a sudden, black could be lost in just a few moves, right? We see the eval bar saying it's not much of anything. But for E takes D7 here, now Jan has a lot to figure out. Unbelievable. And Jan, I apologize for the, for the ambulance. That's coming after Jan's queen. <laughs> Bishop H7 um, or the rook. Wait, so you have to give up the... King H8? What? What do you do? Oh, you have knight c3 here. And that, if we pull up an analysis board, leads to, I believe, a bailout. DC, rook c8, bishop h7 check. It's actually less complicated than it appears. King takes h7. Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. And black should not lose this, right? Yeah, e even if black lost both those queenside pawns, I'm still not sure black loses this. So, yeah, this is uh, a hold. And what a save this is going to be behind Drake, and it seemed like the game was over after bishop c5 check, and it perhaps should have been. Unreal. Will Jan find knight c3? It seems to be the only move. You know, you know when annotations are made and there's exclamation point, question mark? That's wow. how this game went. To meet you with an exclamation point of knight g5 takes f7, and then a big question mark of f4 to f5. So it's like uh, some brilliance some shaky moves but right now yon he's spending time but he probably wishes he spent this time several moves back well queen takes e5 you get the temptation of that move it has a certain it has a certain aura to it it looks like it's the winning move but he just didn't calculate it he took five seconds in that position a very uncharacteristic and i mean to use that specific word a very uncharacteristic mental lapse for the new yon and I get why he made this play. He just took a piece on d4 with check, and he's up a minor piece. You think, oh, I calculate it here. But then you see rook f2. My rook on c8 under attack. My queen is about to be lost. So Jan, uh, he's not going to be happy with this one. But the good news for him is he did just play knight c3. I don't think he's losing this position. And if that's the case, he gets game two with the white pieces. Yeah, he, he should and I'm sure will focus on the positives. Yes, this was a topsy-turvy game. But he also could have lost it. He can console himself by saying that if Dimitri had found the right move after king takes f7, black's king is caught in the crossfire there. So when all is told, a successful result for Jan, assuming this game will indeed fizzle out. And I'm trying to see if there's any way Dimitri can, like, queen e6. Oh, he played as Whoa. soon as I was going to say. Wait a like, second. Is there some kind of move but here? Isn't there a mate? Or am I crazy? Oh, the rook is pinned. Oh, my God. <laughs> the rook is pinned. Otherwise, there'd be mate. Yeah, you would take twice on c8 and, and then go rook f8. Incredible. And then those darn chess.com bugs not letting you play rook f8. There's I a problem know, with Full the... of glitches. Ugh. So What does Dimitri do here? Is there queen g6? Then bishop e4. Oh, boy. Then I probably just get myself a losing position, don't I? Wait, what is the... It's zeros according to the bar. It's zeros according to the bar. But I think you need something cold-blooded like queen f5. And then... And if, okay, you took here first. Oh, because now you can't play... You, can, you can't play bishop e4. Right, but you can play knight e4. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, knight e4, and then try that out for size with a minute on the clock. But I think that's the solution here. The knight e... After queen f5, knight e4 cuts off circulation, the battery between the bishop and the queen, and it pin, puts pressure on the pinned rook. And if you take the 94, you lose your rook on d1 with check. Right. And then after 94, white should probably just calmly play a takes b4 and sign the peace accords after the mass trade on f2. What a 
ridiculously calm move to play. A takes B4 here. Right. Just nothing's the matter. We're fine. Everything's defended. Let's just take some pawns. And it just makes perfect sense because bishop takes e4 is clearly not good after queen takes d1 check. So a There's takes no b4. other moves. <laughs> I mean, whether you and like it or not, process of elimination. Did you see Dimitri there? He's like, I cannot believe that all this just happened and that we're here and we're just going to be an equal admin. Yeah, he's running through the very familiar gamut of emotions. And he's been, yeah, we been doing a lot of head shaking. Listen, we've all been there, having beaten Hikaru and Wesley <laughs> in the same tournament and now saving a game against Jan. We all know what that's like. <laughs> and Dimitri has made it to the finals of the World Cup. And for those of you who follow chess, you know that that is a ridiculously impressive accomplishment because you have to win matches against Grandmaster after Grandmaster after Super Grandmaster. So it just, you know, he, he has experience in match format. Uh, but yeah, right now you can tell that he's been through a lot in these last few games. Jan spending his remaining time trying to find ways to spice this position up, but he's run out of fuel. Like he just doesn't have enough pieces to cause actual problems to Black's King, uh, to White's King. Knight takes F2, gets checkmated on H7. That's actually critical. And uh, we're on to Cincinnati, rookie eight actually. Jan is still trying. All right, but these end games, like let's say you move your bishop to c2 and we trade everything on f2, only white can be better there. Yeah, I don't know why Jan is pressing oh. his luck like this. <laughs> Queen f7. Okay, just putting immediate pressure on this rook on e8. I mean, Dimitri just trying to force Jan to play queen takes f2. He's like, enough of this nonsense. Just take my rook already. But I actually mean it that white is better in the ensuing end game. <laughs> No, we, we, we saw Andraken do this to Fedoseev. No, 100%. And the problem is Black has a king that's not particularly safe. Exactly, because the bishop controls the Luft square. And in a time scramble, Jan now down to a minute on the clock. We know that anything can happen. We know of Andraken's endgame wizardry. Bishop b7 and c6. Jan somehow keeps the tension still. So bishop c2 is a move I really like here. Uh, yes. we, can't, we can't take on e4. The rook on d1 is loose, but after bishop c2, I think at long last, the trade on f2 is mandatory. And when that happens, rook d6 is a threat. I, I really you think that Andrake can press. Queen e3, could you still do that? Oh my well, gosh. Queen... I think it, it very much consistent with Jan's style to play queen e3. And he's thinking here, which means that it's very likely he makes it look like queen e3. But the longer he thinks, the greater the possibility that he just says, hey, I don't want to lose this game either. But no, after queen takes f2, it's like the worst version of that endgame because now the rook is heading to d6. Right. Has and Jan dug himself into a hole? There's queen e3. What a move. I have a queen f4. Oh, you can take on that too with the knight. Oh my god, a knight to h3 and the rook blocks the check on d8. Yeah, that's Holy actually... Smokes. 10 seconds for Dimitri. You gotta go. He has four bars of connection, so I'm looking at that. No, same. Five Dimitri, seconds. Dimitri, what are you doing? Three seconds. Dimitri. One second! Oh my gosh, it was B5. So wait, if you just trade everything on F2 now? And take B5. And there's rookie two check at the end. So I think Black could potentially go up oh a pawn here. Oh my gosh, and Jan will go up a pawn, but Dimitri, rook D2, and he should be able to hold this. So Bishop G6, rook B8. Nice move. But just get my rook behind that pass pawn. And five seconds for the rest of the game. Dimitri has his work cut out for him. Bishop B8, great move by Jan. This is dangerous territory for Dimitri Andreykin extremely rook d8 is going to come if you play king d2 so now, oh time, my gosh time to start bringing that king in for black right at some point you can't win the game without it oh he pushes bishop f7 does he want oh there's rook d8 take d3 d8? <laughs> oh he missed the tactic does he have it again no because the bishop can't get to the other diagonal but if rook b1 he has rook d8 takes Make d3 a move. 0.9 seconds on that move Make gotta a go, move. Gotta go. gonna fly Oh it's my zero, gosh. Zero, zero. If he saves this game, Jan is going to be furious no, with but, himself. But there's no way now the pawn is landing on B3. This king is king. completely winning. How did Jan do that? Dimitri got himself into too much time wait, trouble. Wait, 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 wait. Bishop C. Oh. Rook F2. Okay, Rook F3. I feel like there's. Dimitri, Dimitri wow, move. This game. Move, Dimitri. One second. Move. Oh, my gosh. Wait, can Jan play 
Bishop yeah, F rook G3. Bishop F5. Make move, a move. 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 He's going to flag. He flagged. No, he didn't. What? He had zeros for like five minutes. <laughs> he, he, now he flags. Yeah. His position was completely lost. So normally I would feel bad when somebody uh, loses on time like that. But no, nah, he was Okay, this was tough. just to show this was the moment on move 42 when Jan could have gone rook D8 and then rook takes D3. And Bishop G6. That would have ended the game faster. What an unbelievable effort by Jan to produce those winning chances. Was that incredible or what? It was an absurd game because at first Jesus. we thought that Dimitri would have the attack, but then he aired with his F4, F5. It was completely winning for Jan somewhere uh, in there. It was complicated, but tactically speaking, he had the upper hand and then he rushed his decision. So Jan de Pomshi, I think maybe in part, because he knows he can lose the first match and still get a second match, he's like a little too calm as he pours his tea off to the side, off screen here. Uh, but yeah, that was a topsy turvy game. And now a must win game for Dimitri Andraken with the black thesis against Jan's Catalan, which has been not only unbreakable, but Jan has just been playing it for a win. How is Dimitri going to handle this task? I'm silent because I just don't know how you beat Jan. I don't Pomsky know either. Black. You don't. <laughs> you uh, play um, something very sharp. Maybe D, maybe early D takes C4 and like knight C6. There's a lot of lines that black can play in the Catalan to, to, to give yourself chances. But I think Dimitri is going kind of for the long game here. He just wants to position with a lot of pieces on the board. And look at Jan. He's saying no D takes C4 stuff for you. I'm just going to play a very nice, safe game because you need right. to beat me. Where I know the ideas, which is maybe the worst thing. I mean, Jan knows all of these, where to put the knight on D2, when to put it on C3. Mm -hmm. And if, if a person knows an opening that well, you're not beating them most of the time. Yeah, we might get like one of these knight E5, knight FD7 type of positions. So look at Dimitri. He's pressing forward on the queen side. He knows he needs to do something out of the ordinary. Now, E4 is the stock move in such positions. And Jan plays it. And Dimitri needs to do something random. Yeah, knight a6. Sure. Yeah, I he's like unbalancing it. the position, which is what you have to do. <laughs> and Jan says, okay, your knight wanted to go to b4. No, yeah. not for you today. <laughs> no knight b4 for you. But Jan, he needs to be a bit careful here because black is getting ready to play c5. And especially with the queen on c2 and a rook coming to c8, that could be a bit of a nuisance. Right. With a big space advantage like that and a big chunk of the center comes great responsibility. So you absolutely have to tread carefully if you're young. But I like the move B3. This completes the development, or prepares to complete the development with Bishop B2. That's right. And it's just so solid. How is he going to lose this? Wait, C5 I think has a... Oh, oh it does it. Takes just... Knight G5? Yeah, that's what I was looking for. And I think that white should be absolutely no worse there. That might lead to total liquidation, too, which is even worse. So he takes on e4, but this is clearly better for white. Oh, this is just bad for black. Knight e Maybe not knight e5 just yet. Maybe like a bishop move. Bishop f4? Bishop f4, yeah. Good knight on a6, right? They're not phenomenal. It's, it's actually <laughs> semi-threatening to go to c5, which is kind of funny. But no, Dimitri, I mean, he's he's trying to unbalance the game, but... As a consequence, he's just much worse, and that's that. But sometimes you have to do that, right? Like we saw in Fabi. previous matches, Fabi against Alexis Serrano, just playing kind of random stuff just for the long game, and Jan correctly puts his bishop on f4. So what can Black's plan be? You want to play c5, but now after knight e5, you just can never make that move. Yeah, knight e5 just sitting on Black completely. You can also play... No, this is... I was thinking of playing like rook a e1, no, but that drops the a3 pawn. You don't want to do that. Yeah, knight e5 is definitely the move here. 100%. Goes for it, and this is just kind of miserable for black. I'm yeah, I'm struggling to come up with an idea. I mean, Jan just might win this outright. It's plus two. It, it looks like a plus two position. Yeah, ugh. Like white can play h4, rook e1, rook d1, all these sort of things. But as you you made mention earlier, don't drop a3. That would be like one of these blunders that you can make. Right. That would be tragic. 
Knight g4 by Jan. I was indicating that, but I actually didn't notice the black has bishop g5. That somewhat changes my mind on the move, but you know, you could also take and just go back to e5. I mean, again, how is black going to win this position? Just don't blunder f5, right? Like some kind of f5 oh, fork, right? You just don't want to uh, run into that. It doesn't work in the current position, but that's the only way I could see black somehow doing anything. I love that Jan is taking his time. But I think Dimitri also loves that Jan's taking his time. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> because yeah, he's he, yeah, he's deciding what to do here. Like, think about how Dimitri lost that last game. It was even, but Dimitri started getting in time trouble, and he, started, he gave away his B-pawn. And here, if Jan gets in time trouble, which never happens, then Dimitri could probably find some tactical sequence that confuses him. Yeah, Jan is not a huge Jan is not a fan of time scrambles at all. He he tries to avoid them at all costs. So Dimitri's got to keep all the pieces on the board. Go rook f d eight. Just hang around, hang around, and you know keep your fingers crossed that you'll get an opportunity. But the way Jan is playing, I I'm really pessimistic. Right, White can just play like rook e one, but don't drop your a three pawn. I actually think that. It's not out of the realm of possibility that White just blunders that pawn because I would blunder that pawn. Yeah, it's not a common source of contact. Queen on e7, pressuring the pawn on a3. I'm not even sure if it's bad to blunder that pawn, like because it Maybe distracts it's a the black queen. Queen g5 or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, you, you, def you definitely should not be giving away that pawn. If you no, rook fe1 is the move. H5. Okay, Dimitri will play h6, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Now I think Jan will go rook e1. Nope, 95. So is it c5 time yet? I think it might as well. Yeah, I think it is c5 time. And I think Jan is inviting it. And he's going to try to trade all the pieces. But with the open center like that, it's it's a game, you know? It's a game. It's one of these situations down here where it's like practical versus objective. Like Yes, the eval has sort of equalized. The engine says that white lost most of his advantage, but mm -hmm. if he can just trade queens and make sure he can never possibly lose, then it was a good choice. But I actually, yeah, I'm starting to feel this a little more for Dimitri, even though it's far from a position where he can play for a win. It just seems like he has more chances. Well, if the D file opens and Jan is the one who controls it completely, then I just don't see Black getting any chances. So let's right. see what Dimitri came up with here. He trades. Yeah, B4. but B4, no, I don't see this happening. He, he wants some kind of knight E4, knight G5. Please let me checkmate you in the light squares, but that's not happening. And there's this very typical idea of driving the pawn up to B5 and establishing an outpost for the knight on C6 to make matters even worse for Black. No, nah, this is... This is pretty miserable. And, I mean, Dimitri has had a fabulous day, but uh, game one of this match, Donnie, just giving away that position by giving, first losing the pawn, getting in time trouble, uh, that just did him in. Yeah, but earlier on in that game, we'll, we'll revisit it, but not playing bishop h7 check, going up in exchange, you know, going to that very tense position and giving Jan a chance to squeeze the life out of that position. An unfortunate ending, but doesn't take away from, as you said, uh, just a historic day, honestly, for, for Dimitri. Beating Wesley and Hikaru back-to-back in matches, that is something very few people have done, if anyone has really done that. But uh, right now, let's see. Is there any chance for Dimitri? I just, with Rook D1 being such a logical move right now, and then That's Queen nice. D7 to follow, just... How in the world do you win this? No, you don't. Knight g5 doesn't even threaten anything because the knight on e5 is covering the f3 square. Yeah, queen d7. I think queen d7 ends it. And a draw for might be forthcoming after queen d7. And here we go. Queen, eight, uh, queen d7, knight h3 check might be the idea. Yeah, the king h2. And I know you're going to win the f2 pawn, but my rook's landing on d7. I'm going to win your b6 pawn, your f7 pawn. Although you can't take on f7 at the end of that line because of knight g4 check, but... Oh, I, that's actually... We should show that. Um, I mean, we're I think getting... The players should show that. Uh, knight g3 can't go king f1, so... 
yeah, we're seeing going to see exactly this kind of line. Because mm -hmm. black is zero other choice in the matter. Yeah, but there's also this big issue for Dimitri. He can never play f6, and not just because Ben Feigl told him he couldn't, but because <laughs> the knight will just sink in on g6. We'll have a nice first-class seat to the action, and there's nothing that black can do. And even in an end game, there, there's all these mating nets. With, there's so many games that have been lost because of those mechanisms with knight g6 and rook d8. Look yeah. at Dimitri. He's like not even looking at the screen. He understands that this is getting out of hand, but he has to move quickly. I think that's the only way he has even a remote shot at getting this game. But the thing is, he cannot avoid a queen. A queen a Does he play queen a8? I guess that is the only way to avoid a queen trade. No, but an f4. Oh, that just ends it, doesn't it? Knight h3, king h2. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then he has to play knight h3. I, I don't think there's much to think about here. No, it's the only opportunity for him. Maybe he's just kind of letting it all sink in that yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not going to get this match, but this is definitely not the way to make the attempt right now. No, 100%. But you lose with the white pieces to in a, in a match like this. You usually don't have that great of a chance anyway. It's similar in the World Cup, which is the other big two-game uh, match tournament where if a player loses with white in the first game, there have been pretty famous cases of, of players winning on demand of the black piece. It's always so impressive, but it's very few and far between. Right. So still thinking is Dimitri Andraken. And now his clock is down to 537, the same as Jan's clock. He doesn't even have that anymore. And then He's, now I'm just, I, yeah. I'm just getting curious as to what's going on in his mind, but it's probably just uh, you know, letting his his feelings finally, you know, after three straight tough matches, you know, it's hard to be disappointed in theory when you beat Wesley So and Hikaru Nakamura, but now that he's in the final, I'm guessing yeah. he's like, I wish I could have given this a better fight. Well, I think he's thinking, yeah, if I had drawn the first game and, you know, this game would have been up for grabs. It's uh, he regrets. I mean, it's ten thousand bucks. It's a lot of money that's on the line, and you know how chess players work. We're all unbelievably tough on ourselves, and he's not sitting there saying, "I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. I beat a car and Wesley." He's going after himself for losing that first game. That's that's why we watch. It's true, and that's how these players get as good as they are. Is that right? You know, they can win eight games out of nine in the nine-round tournament. They're like, yeah, but that game I lost, you know, I really just didn't play my best. And it's like, well, you just beat all these people. Hashtag, yeah, but... Guke hashtag Gukesh. <laughs> right, right. Gukesh beating everybody at the Olympia, but the one game he lost against Abu Sitar, that's the one that ends up sticking out the most. So right. Knight H3 check played after three and a half minutes. Obviously, that was a move he could have played in Okay, so now seconds. I can find, we have waited so patiently where I can oh. show. Rook oh. so I have a Knight G4 checked really quickly. Yeah, yeah, that, but this position. No, come mm. on. I think Jan specifically chose this because it's so drawn. Rookie seven, rook takes c6. Yeah, it's just. Well, rookie seven, knight c. Yeah, I guess you yeah. protect everything. Mads, you know. <laughs> like, I mean, you at, could also play rook d7 and knight Yeah, and rook f4 might just like even be better for white. Yeah, it is. It is. But rookie seven is clinical if you're making a draw if you want to make a draw exactly and that's the luxury of winning the first game and also, Epo, wow funny mindset to have right it's like, oh i know i'm better with rook f4 but let me play rookie so he offered a draw actually and i think dimitri declines it oh wow let's go dimitri i like that spirit right no nothing to lose you might as well make a couple more moves i always have felt that way if you're in a two-game match a draw and you lose the first game, a draw is the same as a loss. So why not just lose the game? Fight. It's literally the same as a loss, right? Yeah. Who, who, I don't think Dimitri Andreken cares about his online rapid rating right now. <laughs> no. What do you mean? I, I heard him getting nervous about it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> he was... Okay, it's plus four. Okay, I think... I, I can understand why Jan offered the draw. I, I, that, that isn't like an obnoxious move or anything because he's completely winning. Knight G6, I think, is good enough. Mm -hmm. Five, yeah. 
Yeah, night. Oh, night D seven's coming. Brr. Oh gosh, knight C six. If that weren't good enough, knight yeah. D seven. Yep. Yeah, and I think Dimitri might reciprocate the draw for right about now. <laughs> and then you're going to see Jan decline it. <laughs> right. Just out of principle. There was a, a famous incident in the World Cup where Ivanchuk was playing Geary. And I think Vasily won the first game. The second game, you know, Vasily plays a nice game. He outplays Anish. Anish offers him a draw. Now, in that situation, a draw is almost tantamount to a win. But Vasily declines it. And he ends up making the draw anyway, and he gets upset. I mean, he, he advances against Anish Giri, but he's upset he didn't win that second game. He doesn't care about the result of the match. That's really funny. I mean, Fabiano in the last round of the candidates, when he beat Grishuk, uh -huh. all he needed was a draw. And he said, nah, my position is pretty good at this point. Let's play on. But right now, Jan's position is amazing. Oh, he did that? Fabi declined a draw? I don't know. If a, I think a draw was offered at some point. Oh, and... Wow. Yeah, he uh, just played on and won. But there's difference there, right? Like the uh, FIDE rating is very important yeah, to yeah. those players. Um, right now, I think that Dimitri is more focused on the result than on the G6, mate. Oh, gosh. Can he play Rook C? 97 check. No hesitation. Yep, that fork ends the game. We have the winner of our inaugural RCC season. Unbelievable. And I think that was some applause there for Dima. Uh, yeah, I mean, if yeah, we're, I'm seeing ghosts. <laughs> no, but if we're being honest, right, coming into this match, just making it through the loser's bracket was an accomplishment enough. But no matter who made it through, Jan is the heavy favorite because yeah. he can afford to lose one match and then get an immediate second one. And so for Dimitri, he knew that he was the underdog, even if they were playing just two games. But the fact that he would have to win two matches around, congratulations, are in order to Jan Nepomneshi, the winner of the Candidates Tournament twice in a row, now the winner here at the Rapid Chess Championship. You can see on the screen, the loser takes home second place and $20,000, that's for Dimitri Andrekin, $30,000 ready to go to Jan Nepomneshi's bank account. We could not have asked for a better finale. That first game was exhilarating. Jan and Dimitri are both just monsters. They're in incredible form. But right now, Jan is just... I mean, I have no words for him. He is a force to be reckoned with. He's winning every tournament that he's playing in. And like we were discussing, you can just sense the confidence and the precision emanating from his fingertips. And we saw that again today. I mean, just... A great display throughout this entire event by Jan Nepomneshi. And, uh, you know, to get invited here to then win the matches he had to, including against Hikaru Nakamura and then against Dimitri Andrekin. But I think in some ways the star of the show, just because it was less expected, has been Dimitri Andrekin. So even though he finishes in second place, he deserves a world of credit for his performance. He absolutely does. To go through the loser's bracket like he did, that game against Hikaru Nakamura will remain, in my opinion, as one of the the best positional efforts in Rapid. I mean, even by the standards of a classical game, that was an absolute masterpiece. So Dimitri Andrei, can, he will hold his head up high. He can hang his hat on those $20,000 that he has received as his prize. And obviously his regular season as well, with that second place finish behind Hikaru Nakamura, was nothing short of amazing as well for sure and the games may have concluded but the action has not because we are going to bring in uh, the players for an interview so stay tuned everybody we'll be back here with an interview with yana Palmshi, the winner of the rapid chess championship finals presented by coinbase
The Rapid Chess Championship is brought to you by Coinbase. Whether you're looking to make your first crypto purchase or you're an experienced trader, Coinbase has you covered. You can earn crypto by learning about crypto at Coinbase.com. Explore DeFi and Web3 with your Coinbase wallet. Get exclusive rewards when you spend with your Coinbase card and much, much more. Learn more at Coinbase.com slash chess and get $10 in Bitcoin when you sign up and verify your account. Check them out. Use the command sponsor or command Coinbase today and go to Coinbase.com to get that Bitcoin, baby. It is our pleasure to be joined by the Rapid Chess Champion, Jan Napomashi. Jan, it seems like you like being interviewed by me and Danya because you keep winning events. Yeah, then, you know, that was my goal to speak to two to, to guys. Yeah. Missed you a lot. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while since the yeah. candidates. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> um, Jan, uh, I want to rewind, start by rewinding a little bit to your win against Hikaru Nakamura yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking. Uh, a couple of times about the Hikaru effect, the psychological pressure that Hikaru puts on players, particularly in online games. Did you feel that at all? And if so, uh, how did you surmount that? And what are your thoughts about, do you think that win was your most important win of the RCC finals? It's hard to say. Probably uh, I was more affected by, I don't know, Moron effect, uh, which affected me in the, in the first game. So, which, uh, I mean, okay, by no means I had no, you know, no right to lose this game. Yeah, just having slightly better with zero risk and then, okay, going to night end game. And yeah, once it got tricky, he, he played just brilliantly. Uh, I guess he used most of his chances, but uh, yeah. So it was more or less some moronic effect, <laughs> uh, which was like uh, cast, it, uh, cast it on myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, second game was quite unfortunate because uh, I think uh, it's, you know, I guess lately Hikaru prefers to play some solid positions and overall I would say this not quite his cup of tea, especially when he ran out of his prep, uh, it's it's too chaotic. And the Armageddon game, I think it was typical Armageddon game, so Black, let's say, achieved everything he could dream about and then, uh, you know, when you have everything, you don't know what to do, and uh, uh, that's somehow which something you know what happened to me for many times in Armageddon, like both colors. So then it's you know too close to to the goal, you start like doing some nonsense, and yeah, if the opponent managed to to keep the game going, it's already it's uh, you know already difficult to to keep your head cool. I mean, Jan, you mentioned that second game and how he ran out of his preparation. How do you, as a top-level chess player, decide when to use some kind of deep preparation, maybe a novelty? So how do you, you know, choose those moments? Well, frankly speaking, I think it was Hikaru who used this uh, Bishop at 65 idea, uh, which is quite smart. But uh, I think, yeah, it requires uh, quite a bit of knowledge. So, yeah, I'm just... Yeah, training. Uh, I mean, in, in, in some way, I was happy to have some extra Armageddon games to play them with White to train some Catalan. So, because I think last time I played Catalan uh, as more or less, you know, frequent opening was when I was 10. And uh, lately it was only like time to time. But um, yeah, for now it's some new experience and uh, every extra White game is a big relief. Jan, were you watching uh, the Andrekin matches before your match? And if so, uh, who were you? Was there somebody you were hoping to face, or is there no difference to you? You're focusing instead on your own on your own game. Well, first of all, kudos to Dmitri because he just yeah, I think he, he did just great. He I think swindled Redley in quite a suspicious position in uh, in the first um, in the first match, and then. Uh, yeah, it was never easy, but he he managed to hold it in the game one and the game two. I think he just uh, outplayed and just yeah was was just I think just a big positional achievement. And yeah, it's quite sad that probably after playing you know after having such a tough schedule, he he wasn't you know as fresh against me. And obviously, yeah, he yeah he gambled a little. He I think he he, he blunders a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we 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 discussed uh, you know games just just a little bit after. 
after the match, but uh, yeah, just completely outstanding. And once again, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 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 really sorry he he couldn't make his best in, in our match. Well, Jan, one of the big storylines of this event is the Armageddon bidding format. So against Hikaru, you bid the full 10 minutes to get the white pieces. How do you choose how much time you're going to bid? Does it depend on the opponent? Does it depend on how the match has gone? What goes through your head? As I, as I said before, I was just willing to train uh, Catalan for white. <laughs> no, uh, no jokes, no jokes. I mean, I swear. Okay, yeah, it would be like quite uh, quite tricky if someone would, uh, you know, outclass me and uh, pick 959. Uh, so, but I think even then, uh, you know, the educational educational part would be would be priceless for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And final question for me: uh, Could you rate your overall RCC experience, regular season and finals, on a scale of one to ten? And can we expect you? Uh, to play consistently in the weekend RCC's next season? Well, uh, somehow I think I was I was trying to to play more or less often when it was like the first half until uh, okay until okay, the, the candidates camp uh, and the Bucharest tournament started and then a little bit gave up on it and then I was like I think I, I was puzzled with, uh, with the scoreboard I thought okay anyway I will qualify I can I can even skip last two last two tournaments and then uh, suddenly I understood it won. So yeah, last two last two legs were a little bit yeah tricky. Uh, but uh, yeah, once again, thanks for giving me the wild card to the finals. It's uh, yeah, it's an honor and yeah, it, it worked it worked out perfectly. Uh, yeah, obviously I like uh, I like this ten plus two format. And at the same time, I don't quite like this ten plus zero, ten plus zero. Uh, in the in the Swiss parts, but um, uh, yeah, and also and also perhaps I would also uh, say that probably it would be you know uh, more uh, more wise to grant let's say in the QO parts, yeah, uh, you should choose uh, you, you know you should give a right to choose to the you know to the higher seed uh, which color does he play the first game with uh, because. In my opinion, uh, like uh, I mean, okay, it's, of, co of course it's matter of taste, but I mean, somehow against some opponent you want to start with black, and, and against someone you want to start with white. I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, always uh, you know it's it's always tricky, but uh, yeah, somehow it, it shouldn't be like this. But yeah, overall it's yeah, overall was a good run, and yeah, hope hope to return. Well, speaking of formats, Jan, you are not just a uh, super grandmaster in chess. You like other games like Dota and Hearthstone. Uh, so what do you think about the double elimination format? It's not used much in chess, and you didn't really have to use it yourself because you didn't lose a match. But what do you think of the double elimination format? Uh, well, it, uh, it, I mean, it, it was cool because it, yeah, it reminded me of uh, good old Dota times, yeah? Because in Dota, you mostly play double elimination. But as for me, I think I uh, was saying to Pete for many times that, uh, for for example, for the World Cup, it, it would be very fair if we can, uh, uh, you know, find a solution like which which benefit which benefit do we grant to the you know the winner of the upper bracket, uh, let's say in the super final, uh, in the grand final, if we find like a decent uh, a decent bonus for uh, coming to the grand finals without a loss. Then it would be like an, an, an awesome addition to the World Cup because, uh, yeah, it's some somehow like these you know, these KO system tournaments are too rough. So yeah, it was some you know nostalgia for me to to play like this, and yeah, but of course no one wants to go to a lower bracket, yeah. <laughs> well, you certainly did not find yourself there. So once again, massive congratulations to you, Jan Nepomji. We're getting very accustomed to saying that. So a uh, job well done, and we look to seeing more excellent chess from you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. And there you have it, your rapid chess champion, Jan Nepomji. He takes down compatriot and friend Dmitry Andrekin in the grand finals. Uh, the 2-0 score that doesn't necessarily tell the whole score story there because game one was fascinating but we have more exciting events just because the rapid chess championship is over with does not mean we don't have more in store for you but good luck prepping for this tournament because you will not be able to chess.com is hosting 
two to the 2022 Fisher Random World Championship qualifiers on August 22nd and August 29th. Who will win a spot in these qualifiers to face reigning Fisher Random World Champion Wesley So and World Chess Champion Magnus Carlson? I don't know, but don't miss out on this exciting format right here on chess.com. And no surprises here as we get to that part of the day. It is your Coinbase Rapid Recap. And Danya, we had no choice. We have to pick a game from the winner, Yana Pomashi. We do indeed. And the game that we picked is his first game in the finals, the grand finals against Dimitri Andrekin. Jan has the black pieces in this game. And Dimitri Andrekin had just uh, finished defeating Hikaru Nakamura um, and Wesley So. And here he is facing Jan with white. The opening, Robert, pretty tame. Uh, Dimitri repeats the opening that brought him success against Hikaru Nakamura, but very quickly, Jan displays astute opening preparation and gets the game right away into a complicated middle game. That's right, because this looks just like simple development, but after Black Castle and strikes with C5, he's taking advantage of the fact that White's king is in the center and White's made a bunch of pawn moves. So after the capture on C5 and the queen comes to C2 here, Dimitri says, I'm okay with a fight. I'm not just going to trade queens and try to make a draw. And it did become a fight. And it became a fight very quickly. Jan develops his knight to d7 in order to not obstruct the long diagonal once he develops his bishop. And a very big move by Dimitri. e4, super committal. There are clear drawbacks. He weakens the dark squares. He opens the diagonal for Black's bishop. But it's quite clear that he is setting uh, the preconditions for a potential e5 pawn push. Jan stops him in his tracks with queen c7. After knight b8 and b4, we felt that Dimitri kind of started taking over the initiative. And the next critical moment occurred a couple of moves later, both sides developing their remaining pieces. Dimitri forced to drop his bishop back to defend that e4 pawn. And Robert, here, we suddenly felt that Jan started losing control of the game. He played this very impulsive move, knight h5. Usually being influenced by Wesley So is a good thing, <laughs> but just like Wesley against Andrejka in two matches prior, this knight maneuvering did not help because it does threaten knight f4. G3 stops that, and because the knight is in danger of being stuck on the side of the board with move e5, and as you were pointing out, the queen is looking at that diagonal, he goes knight back to f6, but this gives white the time to launch an attack, first with the rook coming to d1, and then to pawn to a5, in comes the knight to g5, and all of a sudden, there are tactics galore. Tactics galore indeed, and Dimitri Andrejkin does not hesitate. He sacks on f7, opening up Black's King, an idea that you called reminiscent of certain lines within the Maron Sloth. He follows up with the move e5, and the critical moment of the game occurs after knight d5. Black's King seeks to mount its escape to g8, and apparently... This is an incredibly difficult move to find. Bishop h7 would have stopped the king from escaping and given white long-lasting attacking chances. The position here is tremendously unclear. But instead, Dimitri, he went for a plan that is A, too slow, and B, too weakening. He shoves the f-pawn up the board. But Robert, after f5, Jan beautifully revealed the flaw in Dimitri's ointment here. Yeah, it would seem like it's Black's king that's in grave danger, but look at White's king. Bishop c5 check, that's a check on the dark squares, and then look at the light squares, the bishop on b7 acting like a sniper. So Dimitri was forced to trade off attacking pieces, and here the move knight c3 was a brilliant shot. It was just trying to distract White's pieces away, and the knight needs to stay put defending the bishop. Unfortunately, too many of White's pieces are under attack, but instead, Jan rushed a little bit with queen takes c5, and Danya, this gave Andrejkin a chance. And this led to a forced line after f takes c6, king g8. Jan calculated all the way up to this moment. What he didn't realize is that after rook f2, not only is the black rook hanging, but there is also the devastating threat of bishop h7 check. This forced Jan to think on his feet. He found the only move not to lose. That's knight c3. And here, Dimitri had a chance to essentially bail out into a risk-free endgame by taking the queen and playing bishop h7 check. The game would have ended in a draw should he have chosen this continuation. But instead, Dimitri keeps the tension. He gives a check on e6, he takes on c8, and he goes for a position that sure looks incredibly promising for white. But Robert, uh, that happened to be an illusion, and it's actually white who happens to be on the defensive here. 
That's right, because for the time being, knight e4 cuts off the battery between bishop and queen, which is threatening queen h7 checkmate. Now the rook on f2 remains pinned by the queen. The bishop on d3 is pinned because the rook on d1 is loose, and that forced Andre to play the very calm of a takes before, which is a good move, restoring pawn equality, although now it's an extra exchange for white. And after the next couple moves, rook e8, queen f7, bishop c6, at this point after bishop c2, this is a great decision with only a minute on this clock because queen takes f2. If you just force the pieces off the board, then white actually has the upper hand because look at the piece activity. The bishop cuts off the king's escape square, the rook coming to d6, which attacks that b6 pawn. So white is first to the activity here, and then black would be having a tough task to defend. So instead of this, queen e3. And the point is that, I mean, Dimitri went wrong here with b5, but if queen went back to f4, then there's this move, knight takes f2 because queen takes e3. It looks like the rook has to take and there are back rank problems, but first, knight h3 check, then you take on e3, and there is no back rank check me because the bishop and rook team up to defend the e8 square. Well explained, and it turns out that queen takes f2 was indeed one of the ways to force a drawn game, but instead, Dimitri, with only seconds left on his clock, he panics and plays b5. This allows Jan to finally take that rook, but at the end, Jan picks up the extra pawn on b5, simultaneously threatening rook e2. No question that this is objectively a draw, but with only seconds left on the clock and some lag issues on top of that and Jan's incredible conversion technique, Dimitri was unable to hold this endgame. First, Jan put the rook behind the pawn. He brought the bishop back. Now, a little bit later, as Dimitri's position keeps getting worse and Jan keeps pushing his pawn, here, Jan had a chance to win the game immediately with a check, followed by rook takes d3. He missed that, but Robert, the result of the game at this point was already not in question. No, it was not because of the excellent technique from Jan de Pomsky. He puts his bishop on f7. Then he's able to push his pawn in a couple moves to b3, where it's defended. And the reason why this is such an easy win is because you may think the pawn on b3 can be attacked by white's bishop as well. But the only way to get that pawn is to use your bishop, rook, and king at the same time. But then that pawn is used as a decoy because the black king will march in, win the remaining white pawns, and there'll be a winning king and pawn endgame. So there is no chance here. And Jan, he checks the king, and it's not like the white bishop was getting around in time. And Dimitri had one last chance, I think, instead of the move g4 right there, Danya. I believe rook f3 somehow keeps chances alive, but a very difficult move to play without time on the clock. And even then, he probably would have lost. And after bishop g6, the bishop trade is inevitable. The position is completely lost. Here, Dimitri lost on time, giving Jan the critical win in their first match game. And Jan easily held the second game to win the Rapid Chess Championship. And that is your Coinbase Rapid Recap. Yeah, what a performance it was from Jan Nepomshi throughout the tournament. You know, he went unblemished, didn't lose a single match, and he won a couple in Armageddon. He beat Fedoseyev in that third game. He beat uh, Hikaru in a wonderful third game with opposite colored bishops where it looked like he had no winning chances whatsoever. So Jan Nepomshi, he makes it through. He is our rapid chess championship. Very deserved performance from him. What a treat this has been to watch all of these players just at play in top form and taking this tournament so seriously. I think at the end of the day, what we saw in the regular season, what we saw in the playoffs is that each and every one of these players be it the prizes, be it just the pride of calling yourself the Rapid Chess Championship champion over all of the trials and tribulations of the regular season. These players took this as seriously as the most serious classical tournament, and the results show the quality of play was high, it was unbelievably entertaining, and it was a great honor and privilege to have courtside seats to the action all four of these days. Yes, it was a real spectacle, and I'm glad that I was able to have the call with you. And I thank all of our you know, many people in the audience who tune in each and every day. And I do want to give another shout-out to Dimitri Andraken because you heard the champion, Jan Napamji. He was very uh, forthcoming with his praise of Dimitri. He said he played two excellent matches against Wesley and Akara, and he felt like he ran out of steam. And, you know, Jan being very humble, almost apologized that he felt like the final didn't have a fully energized Dimitri Andraken. But I think that when all is said and done, Dimitri would also agree that Jan Napamji is a deserving champion. He absolutely is. He's been on such a tear, and this is just the continuation of what has been perhaps the most memorable year, not even perhaps, the, definitely the most memorable year, the most memorable few months of 
his chess career. And I just wanted to want to say that, you know, since uh, this ends the first inaugural season of the Rapid Chess Championship, I've commentated so many of these weekend RCCs, a lot of them with you, Robert. It's been it's been a great pleasure. This has been something I look forward to each and every weekend. Uh, and, you know, I just this is just such a great way to enrich your weekend entertainment to see these grandmasters compete weekend in and weekend out and to see it all culminating in an amazing final i can't think of anything better than that so really really appreciate the opportunity to have commentated as many rccs as i did and i'm looking forward to the second season well said partner the, those words i can't really follow up on i just want to remind everybody of a few things that the uh a history of chess a reflection of us that video is released so please enjoy that i want to remind everyone as well about the women's speed chess championship match tomorrow be between ho yi fan and valentina gunina that's at 5 a.m pacific time you will not want to miss that the winner takes on katarina lakno in the final and of course the Fisher Random World Championship, which will have a live final in Reykjavik. The reigning champ is Wesley. So he took down world chess champion Magnus Carlsen a few years back. But Qualifier 1 begins tomorrow, and it will be right here on Chess.com. So on behalf of Chess.com and myself, Daniel Naroditsky, my co-commentator here, we want to thank Coinbase for sponsoring this event. We want to thank our producer, Matt, for putting on great show after great show. And we want to thank all of you and all the players for making this the best possible event. But we say goodbye and see you soon, because tomorrow more action continues here on Chess.com. Our final four players, Jan Napomshi has a leg up on the competition. He can lose two matches on route to a championship here at the Rapid Cham Chess Championship. But three players, Wesley So, Dimitri Andrekin, Hikaru Nakamura, they're looking to unseat Jan Napomshi and win the crown. This has been a stunning turnaround. He plays there it is. three. No, 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 Knight H5. Knight H5. Knight H5. Goodbye. Sign the score sheets. Dimitri Andrekin with the black pieces from a miserable position, somehow turns the tables in the span of five moves. Okay, Dimitri, gotta go, Dimitri, gotta go, move, Dimitri, move, 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 no, no, move, Oh, he's lagging, and oh, his clock is at four seconds, I'm afraid he's gonna lose on time. No. Okay, he got it, he got it off, which is so nerve wracking. This is over, this is a draw, and Hikaru offers one, and so does Dimitri. Whew. What a slug fest. He has prevented Hikaru from doing anything. He's eating him alive. Is he Where gonna go? Is... <laughs> he goes 92. Oh my yeah. god, the guy is insane. He just doesn't give him even a single chance to take a piece. Is there a mating net? Like just if he just plays B7? B7? Just play B7. Oh, King G3. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's just toying with him at this point. Oh, Rook A7. That's it. Dimitri Andrik, and look at him. And now his reward is a showdown with Yana Pomashi. And I think that Dimitri has many new fans. I don't think after this, we're gonna have to say, oh, people overlook Dimitri. Nah, he's getting not anymore. the credit. Jan simply takes on before as if nothing is the matter, as if F5 is not coming on this on the next move. That's uh -oh. why he Bishop show- Bishop C5 check, Bishop C5 oh! check. Oh, oh no. I think that's a crusher. Yeah, it is. And Jan finds it, Knight C3 now. Take oh! advantage of a pin piece. Oh. F takes C6, you just drop the king back to G8. That was my plan. And you say, my king is as safe as it gets. What about yours? And Whoa, Jan. but Yanni rushed it. He has so much time remaining. Five, Five minutes. minutes. Take a minute, because if you find one move, the game is over on Draken Resigns. You win the RCC, basically. And five seconds for the rest of the game. Dimitri has his work cut out for him. Bishop E8, great move by Jan. This is dangerous territory for Dimitri on Draken. Bishop F7, does he want? Oh, there's Rook D8, take D3! Oh, he missed the tactic! Does he have it again? No, because the bishop can't get to the other diagonal. But if Rook B1, he has Rook D8, takes Make D3. Make a move! 0.9 seconds on that move. Make gotta a go, move! Gotta go. He's gonna flag! Oh it's my zero, gosh! Zero, zero. <sighs> Dimitri, Dimitri move! This game. Move, Dimitri! One second! Move! He's flag. Oh my gosh! Wait, can Jan play? Bishop yeah, Rook G3, Bishop F5, make move, a move. move! Move, he's gonna flag! He flagged, no he didn't! What? He had zeros for like five minutes. <laughs> he, now he flags. Knight G6, please. mate. Oh gosh, can he play Rook C8? Knight check. No hesitation, yep, that fork ends the game. For Dimitri, he knew that he was the underdog, even if they were playing just two games, 
but the fact that he would have to win two matches around. Congratulations are in order to Jan Nepomneshi, the winner of the Candidates Tournament twice in a row, now the winner here at the Rapid Chess Championship. 